Today is Tuesday, July 19th. It is about 7.30 p.m. We are here in Town Hall um, in the auditorium, and tonight is a Planning Zoning Commission public hearing, and we also have a general um, meeting on the agenda. Okay, so let's get started right away. The first item on the agenda is um, number one. The first item is protected landmark number 11. Widler. 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 Yes. Sorry about that. Sorry, man. I could try. There we go. Check one, two. There you go. Let's put this baby closer. <clears throat> Start again. Okay, here we go. Tuesday, July 19th, Town Hall. First time in the public hearing agenda protected town landmark number 11. Special permit application number 329, Town of Darien 40 and 46, Great Island. Proposal to designate the stable building located at 46 Great Island as a protected town landmark under section 1051 of the Darien zoning regulations. Proposal to rent the stables and associated equestrian facilities on Great Island to an outside operator with specialized expertise necessary to run a full service show stable for programmed res re recreational use with specific restriction and limits. These indoor and outdoor facilities, including an 18 stall granite stable and indoor heated riding arena, an outdoor sand dressing ring and a half size polo field, as well as numerous paddocks and riding trails that, compri that comprise the facility. The operator of the facility would be a full service show stable offering full boarding and training of up to 18 horses, a riding lesson, a riding lesson program for ages five years of age and up, and a summer camp program. This 60.92 plus or minus acre subject property is located on the east side of Good Wives River Road and Long Neck Point and consi consists of a total of three separate tax lots identified as map 58 lot 1A, 13.5 acres, 58 lot 1, 45.94 acres, and map 58 lot 1AA, 1 1.4 acres, access way, in the R1 residential zone. The subject property is accessible via causeway at the southeastern terminus of Ringsend Road from Goodwives River Road. The protected landmark aspects of this application has been withdrawn. You want to speak now or later? Uh, you're not going to do anything, are you? So I don't have to do anything. Okay. Um, we received a letter in the mail um, via this morning from um, the first selectman, Monica McNally, asking us to open the hearing and postpone it for, I think, three weeks. Mr. Chairman, I have a copy of that letter here. Okay. It was received earlier today, July 19th. Uh, it's a memo from Monica McNally to Jeremy Ginsburg. As we pursue our due diligence in conjunction with the purchase of Great Island, we would request that the application for the above reference special permit be continued to September 13, 2022. So tonight the Commission's going to open the hearing, uh, immediately continue the hearing to Tuesday night, September 13, 2022, 7.30 p.m. We'll be in room 206 of Town Hall. If anyone wishes to send a letter or an email commenting on the application, you can certainly send those to the Planning and Zoning Office between now and then. Uh, I have nothing further to add. I think that pretty much covers it. This won't be heard this evening. We'll hear it on September 13th. So if anybody's here for the Great Island application, excuse me? Yes, you can. That's correct. So if anyone's here for the Great Island application, it's gonna be postponed um, or September continued 13th. until September. September, Tuesday, September 13th, 7.30 p.m., room 206 of Town Hall. Fantastic, thank you. Does she have to come to the podium? Yeah, she needs to. Ma'am, if you would like to speak, can you please come to the podium? Do you mind? Thank you. It's just everything's being recorded and taped. The, the podium's microphone's right there. Thank you. 
trip on that. If you could give your name. I'm Wendy please. Flamon, 3 Chestnut Street, Darien. I'm sorry, could you Wendy. Wendy? Mm -hmm. Lamond. F L A M A N D. Thank you so much. So, just a question. I read what you read tonight, too. Um, I was more interested in the programs um, than the designation, and I just was trying to see if that fell under planning and zoning as far as the riding program. Yeah, sure, that's great, that's all. I just wasn't sure which meeting to attend. Okay. So, Ms. again, Jeremy Ginsburg, Director of Land Use. Ms. Flamond sent an email earlier today about the possibility of therapeutic riding as part of this application. Ultimately, the decision on what the proposal will be will be uh, in the jurisdiction of First Selectman Monica McNally. Uh, so certainly, that might be a modification between now and September 13th. I will pass your email along to Ms. McNally uh, for her consideration as to whether she wishes to modify the application accordingly. Okay, so, so it's already down to the one, the one organization and their application, which is great. They're already there, I know, I know. So, um, I sent it to the first selection, too. Oh, okay, so Thank she has it. And sure thing. Certainly, thank you. Okay. Ma'am, ma the other thing I can tell you, with regards to their application, which is online, there is a little bit of a description of what the um, proposal is relative to what they're planning. Right, Ms. Flamond was hoping that uh, First Selectman McNally could add that to the application. Okay. And so that's ultimately up to the First Selectman. That being? The, the therapeutic riding aspect. Got it, okay, thank you. Okay. Well, so Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Um, let the record reflect that Mr. Rand um, made, made it to meeting at 7:37. We seven minutes to find a way in the building. <laughs> I heard okay. it. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda: Coastal Site Plan Review Number 731, Flood Down Prevention, App Prevention Application Number 433. Charles and Kristen Collier at 65 Pear Tree Point Road. Proposal to relocate an air conditioning unit now located over the Goodwives River and to expand mechanical pad at the northeast corner of the existing residence, construct a deck on the second level of the residence and make improvements to the structure and its mechanical equipment to increase compliance with FEMA requirements of section 820 of the Darien <coughs> zoning regulations and to perform related site development activities within regulated areas, including burying a propane tank in the front yard of the property. The 0 0.63 plus or minus acre subject property is located on the west side of Pear Tree Point Road, approximately 1,000 feet south of its intersection with Goodwives River Road, where it intersects with Long Neck Point, and is shown on assessor's map number 60 as lot 50 in the R1 zone. Jeremy, what do we got? I'm sorry, Jim. Jeremy Ginsburg, Director of Land Use. Uh, this is a property on the west side of Pear Tree Point Road. Uh, house was built, and if you've been out there or seen the site, the house literally is hanging over the water. Uh, it's a non-conforming lot in terms of layout. It doesn't meet setbacks. There's no buildable area on this lot. Uh, and what they're looking to do is it additions and alterations to the house uh, that meet the flood requirements. Uh, there's nothing that touches the ground, if you will. Uh, they're moving an air conditioning unit uh, to be el properly elevated, doing some other internal changes to the property, and doing a nice second floor deck. Uh, so Attorney Wilder Gleason's here present on behalf of the applicant. He's left for you hard copies of photographs and other background materials which will help you better understand the property. Uh, as I said, beautiful property right on the water and uh, in many ways they're making it more flood conforming. Uh, it's not considered a substantial improvement so they don't need to bring the whole thing up to current codes but they are making a number of improvements to minimize flood risk. Uh, Wilder's going to explain that uh, there was a little change in the ZBA schedule so the zoning board will be 
hearing the variance request tomorrow night, but Wilder wanted to make the presentation tonight and theoretically come back next week with a variance in hand. But so they didn't get the variance yet? Okay. Yeah, the ZBA canceled their meeting last week. So Wilder, I think you're first up for tomorrow. Yeah. So okay. Wilder Gleason, Gleason and Associates. Um, Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, so I represent Charlie and Kristen Collier who bought Pear Tree Point Road a couple of years ago. And um, they live right, their main house is right next door to it. So they purchased in September 2020. And my outline that's up here is before you, so you don't have to turn around. Um, but we're seeking planning and zoning approval under Section 810 for a coastal site plan review. Those are right on the Darien River, or Goodwise River, however it's called. We need coastal area management uh, under Section 820 and flood damage prevention. Um, uh, Section 820, and an, an 880 waiver for a stormwater plan. Um, we propose changes to the interior of the existing building and external changes, um, uh, making the building and its equipment more FEMA compliant. And you'll see there's a lot of work that we're doing. So this is the house, um, the Google uh, Earth view, and the house is actually um, on the lower right, the lower left of your screen here um, and the Collier main residence is the one to the right up the hill with the pool and Julie Potter and her husband live just south of this and their house is located about where the white line bisects the Collier main house property just a little south I've put the cursor on that but here's the photographs as you're coming in the driveway you look at this edge of the the north end of the house in the garage and you'll see that there is uh, to the right of the car there there is an air conditioner and the second picture to the right shows the air conditioner on a pad hanging over mean high water you'll see right here and you can see the dock so I'm sorry um, that's the air conditioner right there and on the far side of the house is the dock that goes down to um, the river so the next picture a uh, series of pictures. Um, oh, also up to the left here on the front picture, you'll see where I put the cursor. There is a um, an enclosure. It's a fence, and that's where the oil tank and the generator are located. And those are at elevation 15, which meets the flood regulations. And we're going to get away from oil heat and go to buried propane tank. And um, we're going to take this air conditioner that's on the back of the house and move it up into the, onto an equipment pad with the generator. So those are the two changes. And then up here on this edge where you see, looking, uh, see the chimney um, in this area, we're proposing a dormer for the master bedroom, which is the entire attic floor, basically. And um, so that, that's basically what we're doing, but let me go through some more pictures if I can. Oh, sorry, yikes. Come on. Are you going to photo two what, page? Or are you skipping that? What did I do? He lost it. Just try this again. There we go. Okay. So we've done those two pictures. The second two pictures, we have an image of the front, and you'll see the front door here, uh, image C. The, the screen for the generator and the oil tank are shown on the right front. And then image D is the southeast corner of the house looking back up at the house and the ramp to a deck uh, um, on the south side of the house. And then image E is looking uh, at the south side of the house and the terrace. And you have the main kitchen area and uh, two bedrooms on the first floor and this uh, second floor above with the walkout deck is um, the master bedroom suite. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is the kitchen area up here and the, uh, and the gable end is the master, okay? So we, um, image F is the propane tank in the front yard. It doesn't meet setback. It was installed <coughs> apparently without permits, but we're going to take that and make it bigger and bury it. 
so it'll meet everything. Here's the image of the oil tank and generator enclosure. That's image G. Um, the oil tank is first, and then on the back end, you see sort of the brown top of the generator. We propose to remove this oil tank and put two AC comp compressors there for the new uh, air conditioning. The assessor's record confirms the house was built in 1961 um, before Darien adopted FEMA regs in 78. The house is valued at $956,800. It's three bedrooms, a little over 3,000 square feet, and we can do about $478,000 of improvements without having to lift the house. Um, this letter email from Jeff McDougall uh, dated June 14th, indicates there's no buildable area in the front as, the, as <clears throat> the front and rear setbacks overlap. So you need a variance to do anything on this property. And this is the survey that shows um, proposed conditions. I'm going to blow this up a little bit and focus on one portion of it, which is um, Looking at the house, um, you can see the proposed dormer just above where it says residence. That's the dormer that we're proposing to put in the attic master bedroom. It's located 4.5 feet from mean high water, and we need to get a variance for that. Uh, on the top right corner of the house, there's an AC unit that's at elevation 86. We're in an AE elevation 14 flood zone, so it's so, supposed to be up at elevation 15. We propose to move that from what is the northwest corner of the house up to where the Jenner oil tank is in the front. And I put my cursor on that, um, see right there, okay? And you can see that the proposed in the front, we have the propane tank that we're going to bury underground right here. That will be within the front yard setback, but because it's buried, it's not a structure and that works. So we're eliminating a nonconformity there. And then um, I'm going to bring this back down so we can see. Um, we're 0.63 acres in a one acre zone. We've got about 450 feet along um, the Goodwives River. Our lot depth is 100 feet plus minus when 150 is required. Our front yard is non conforming. <clears throat> Our rear yard is non conforming. We're at zero when we're supposed to be at 40. And the AC unit is over the water at elevation 86. <clears throat> in addition, our existing furnace, air handlers, hot water heater are all on the basement level, or not, uh, the ground floor level at elevation 9 when they need to be at elevation 15. The electrical panel and outlets in the ground floor are below elevation 15. And the propane tank, as I indicated, violates front yard setbacks. We don't have flood vents. All of those conditions are going to be remedied as part of this renovation. We're going to make it way more compliant, and we're going to need the variances that you see at the bottom of this uh, page. So the arch architectural plans call for basically relocating the mechanicals in the ground floor and suspend them from the garage. This is the garage here. They'll be in front of where the cars are so that um, uh, Bo Malpass is the contractor and designer here. They'll be suspended from the ceiling, and all of them will be above elevation 15, one foot above the base flood elevation. We just have enough room to do that. Our first floor elevation is 17.7. The basement or ground floor elevation is 9.0. Um, we're going to relocate the electrical panel and outlets in the ground floor to elevation 14 or 15 as applicable. The panel itself will probably go in the first floor above this ground floor. And the AC equipment that we talked about in the back uh, northwest corner is going to go into that transformer uh, into the pad next to the front deck. We're going to replace windows and install flood vents. On the second floor, or main floor, there's currently a Jack and Jill bed a bathroom for the two bedrooms front and back of the house. We're going to make separate ensuite bathrooms and renovate the um, powder room and do some uh, replacing doors of the kitchen cabinets. Um, on the attic level, what is happening is there's a dormer here that's being popped out so that we have a walkout deck outside of the master bedroom here. And 
this is the master bedroom here, but you walk through a door here to get to the master closet and the master bedroom, which is at the top of the stairs. Um, so that's the basic plan. We have a letter from Christopher Hull, the architect who stamped the plans, saying that um, uh, he will design it to meet flood codes. Even though we don't have to meet flood codes, we'll have flood vents that uh, make this a far more compliant structure than existing and it'll equalize the flood, flood pressure. Um, Bo Malpass gave us an estimate of the cost. That, Wilder, can you please repeat that part again about the, uh, whether you are or you are installing flood vents? Oh, we are. We are installing flood vents. We're taking out windows on the ground floor and putting in flood vents. I didn't understand. We're taking out windows on the ground floor? Uh, uh, the ground floor windows will be replaced and some other windows will be replaced. And we're installing flood vents on that ground floor level so that the flood pressure will be equalized. It, it, it needs to have that happen. Yep. Thank you. So, um, absolutely. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so, Bo's estimate is uh, $380,000 for the cost of the um, uh, changes we're making, which is far less than half. And we're not proposing a substantial improvement, as Jeremy indicated. If we were, we would have to lift the house so the first floor elevation was 15 feet, six feet above what's existing. So we need approvals under Section 810. Um, we got a letter from DEEP, uh, an email from them, saying that the application is consistent with uh, CAM policies. And um, a copy of that was, I left a copies of that. It's a, uh, an email form uh, checklist from DEEP that is part of it. And on page four, it actually says uh, it's, it's consistent with coastal policies. Um, <clears throat> there's a report that indicates there's no impact on coastal resources. We're not doing anything except removing an HVAC compressor that's over the flood waters now, taking that away. Everything else is internal or up above the flood zone and away from coastal resources in developed site area where we're putting the pad and we're burying the oil tank. What about uh, the, the dormer? Is I'm that, sorry? What about the dormer? That doesn't really affect coastal resources. Yeah, it's not going to be. You're going to peel off some roof and then build it up. And, and uh, you know, um, I, I'm confident there won't be any impact on the coastal resources from that. That, that requires a variance because you're building more volume inside a, inside exactly. a setback? That's We're adding a volume o over the existing building envelope in order to make that dormer. <clears throat> and because the house is at zero setback, we're proposing a four and a half foot setback there. Um, we're lifting all mechanics and electric to meet FEMA. We're relocating the air compressor. Um, and we need a determination that we comply with section 880 regarding stormwater. So um, uh, we're asking for a waiver because it's the impervious surface is de minimis. There's a chart of reduction in non-conformities. You'll see all these things that are non-conforming now make, uh, will be made compliant. Um, and even though we're not required to put flood vents in, we're doing that. Uh, we just think it's the right thing to do. So in summary, I think we meet the requirements for approvals under Section 810, 820, and 880, and we'd ask that you provide them. Great. Thank you. Um, did you receive a copy of the letter from Rich Telmanetti dated yes. July 14th? I did, and we're happy to comply with all of his suggestions. Not a problem. Okay. I, I sent it to Bo Malpass and said, can you make that work? And he said, we'll do it. Okay. The, the, the only thing I wanted to say about this is everything seems right. He noted that, he notes that firm maps, firm maps for anyone's edification is the same as FEMA maps. They're a little bit different, but they're the same. It's the same basic item. He's saying for map references on, on all documents. Well, let me just see if I can pull that up. It's the same. It's just, it's just a, to note you're, you're already yeah. going to do it. Craig, that's right, right? I didn't read it, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Firm maps are the same as FEMA maps. Um, yes. The only other item is um, that jumped off the page is a certification that it, co it costs what it costs what it costs upon completion. Uh, Bo said he would be happy to provide an affidavit. No. Have the, a lot of the purpose of testing the final project costs. Yep. Um, you have what a hundred and hundred thousand dollars to play with, something like that. You're three eighty. It's half of. Uh, we have three eighty. It hopefully it comes in at that or well below the right. uh, the the four seventy or whatever it is that we can do. 
When do you just uh, at a, when do you expect to do this? Before, or after the grant list that comes out in October? <laughs> it's going to be the the pro, we'll get the permits, assuming we get them this fall. Start the work, and the grant list will be updated once we get a CFO. Okay. They, they'll reassess. So, um, the reason why because the the cost of the C the if you did it on oh yeah if you did it on October second, the number is going to be higher. Oh, good. It might be. I don't know what the. So we may have a little more room to do, to work with. Exactly. And um, the only thing that I would that I would add to Rich's letter is pictures. We typically require that in the resolutions, right? All well, pictures of the new work. Well, if you want to put it in the resolution, we'll deal with it. Okay. okay. That's fine. Um, any questions for the commission? We want to start on this end. Amy, you want to go first? Um, there, I noted in the packet, did Darren from uh, Department of Public Works, the questions that he had, was he satisfied? Was that after, did you address the letters from Darren and Public Works? Yeah, I didn't see Darren's letter. I don't recall that he had comments on it. I, and I don't know if that was, here, let me. Um, I, Got it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we'll do that. Um, we will do it. We will file a connected. We'll, we'll take care of that. Uh, as built drawing, prepare a licensed land. We're happy to comply with all of these things. Okay. He probably asked for pictures, right? Yeah. And we know about the connected. Um, uh, impervious service uh, permit requirement. Okay. Okay, that was that was my one question, and then Steve already addressed my other question with regards to the letter from DEP regarding the costs. You good? You can go back. Those are my letters. Those are my questions. Are there any questions, comments? No, sir. Thank you. Jeff? All set, thank you. Jim Rand? Uh, I'm okay. Okay, thank you. Would anybody in the general public like to speak to this application? <coughs> Seeing none. Uh, yeah, let's continue it to next. Well, next week doesn't work because the, the hearing is tomorrow. Okay, yeah, let's. Yeah, let's continue to next week. That'd be great. Okay, we're, we're going to keep this application open because we do not have the sign off from the ZBA. Um, they haven't approved this. We're going to continue it until next week, Tuesday, July 26 at 7.30 p.m. in room 206. I got a good coach. Thank you, Wyler. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, next item on the agenda. Uh, uh, prevention application number 430, landfilling and regrading application. Number 530, James and Margaret Tweedy at 94 Near Water Lane. Proposal to construct a new single family dwelling on a now vacant lot, construct, construction of a new driveway, patio area, a pool, and to perform related site development activities within a regulated area, including regrading of the property and conducting and construct, connecting the new house to public water and sewer. The 1.1 plus or minus acre subject property is located on the east side of Nearwater Lane, approximately 530 feet south of its intersection with Nickerson Lane and is shown on assessor's map number 57 as lot 3D in the R1 zone. Correct if I'm wrong, but this is a new subdivision, a five lot subdivision we approved about six months ago? I think it was a four lot subdivision I think it was last year, year and a half ago. So some members may be familiar with it, others may not. It's uh, off a, I'll call it a little lane off near water. And four lots were created. And at the time the commission said, as you redevelop each lot, if it's in the flood zone, you'll have to come back to us for a flood damage prevention application if there's significant regrading, et cetera. So this is the first of the lots to be redeveloped under that subdivision approval. Uh, Craig Flaherty, professional engineers, here on behalf of the applicant to do not only the first house, but he's going to talk a little bit about a shared drainage system, which is part of the project as well. This one with the tree, right? Right. Yeah, the, tree. Yeah, the trees. You got it. 
Uh, right. Welcome, Craig. Thank you, sir. My name is Craig Flaherty. I am a professional engineer licensed in the state of Connecticut, and I am a senior engineer and principal of Redness and Mead, a land use consulting company uh, with offices in Stanford and Wilton. On this project, we've been provi uh, providing land surveying, site civil engineering, and permitting services for our clients. James and Margaret Tweedy, Jim and Meg have joined us tonight uh, in the audience, as well as our project architect, uh, Dan Conlon. Uh, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, uh, this is a part of a four-lot subdivision, which we received approval for in December. Uh, so four out of five of you, I think, should remember. Uh, this is uh, the Tweedy's uh, property. This is uh, the house that they live in today. Um, this is uh, basically a common drive designed as a low-volume local street, but uh, will be rebuilt as a common drive. Uh, this is a neighbor, uh, and this is a neighbor. Um, so the new subdivision road is going to get built here. Um, so in addition to the reserved lot uh, that the Tweedies uh, will continue to live in, there were three lots created. This was uh, lot one, this was lot two, and this was lot three. Uh, it appears as though uh, lot one is likely to be sold to the neighbor. Um, Lot three is likely to stay undeveloped for uh, the foreseeable future and a, probably a long time. And so really we are here tonight to talk about the development of lot two, uh, which uniquely has absolutely no trees on it, which is not something we always get to see with land use applications. Um, again, I'll bring you in a little closer. If it decides to load. Hopefully it will. Let's try opening that up again. There we go. A little bit, okay. So I've just highlighted in blue uh, the overall uh, property perimeter and then highlighted in red where lot two is within that subdivision. So the other unique thing about this application is that all adjoining properties to lot two are in fact held by the applicant. So uh, we, we don't have an abutter that is not the applicant in this situation. Um, and, and the closest houses, of course, is, are this neighbor uh, who is potentially buying this lot, the Tweedies right here, uh, and this neighbor who recently rebuilt uh, which will be adjacent to this lot that is going to be held uh, uh, in its existing condition for a time. So uh, why are we here? Uh, we are here very specifically uh, for approval of a flood damage prevention application and a landfilling excavation and earth removal uh, application. Uh, I try to do a, a simple narrative which I submitted with the application dated June 6, which takes us through uh, the salient points of your review. Um, but uh, ultimately we're going to build uh, this house, attached garage, three car garage. In fact, there's a little bit of a simpler plan here if I go up. One yeah, the sheet. color one's great, Craig. This one? Uh, you like that rainbow plan, that cut and fill one? <laughs> that shows the fill we're, we're putting in. Um, so there's a three-car garage. There's a, a, dry, a driveway coming to the, dry, the garage court uh, and a driveway coming as a processional to the front entrance. Uh, we're showing some patios and ancillaries and um, the potential for a future pool. Uh, we're not asking you to necessarily approve that pool because we don't have all the details associated with it, but We've accommodated uh, that pool in our drainage calculations, and uh, we've accommodated uh, room on the site for it in a manner that's uh, compliant with uh, setbacks and coverage and so forth. So uh, we've kind of planned for it, but uh, not necessarily going to be built uh, initially. The other thing you see on this plan um, are the drainage easements, so that they're kind of in this darker hatch uh, going around a lot. Uh, so we did something. Uh, 
uh, with some floor planning at the time of subdivision. So we had an increase in pervious coverage for the construction of the new common drive. Um, we have potential lot development of lot one, lot development of lot two. We designed this drainage system to mitigate the water quality impacts from all three activities. Um, and that's the common drainage system uh, that uh, Jeremy's talking about. So effectively, Craig, that was approved. Craig, uh, can I just yes, ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I wasn't part of the commission when sure. you did the subdivision. Was there a baseline assumption under which you had impervious surface calculations for future development? Yes. Um, and okay, so even though these other lots may for now be undeveloped, are there caps that we need to be mindful of? Yep. So on the subdivision plans, we wrote exactly what the system was designed for. So the road will be the road. That's not going to change. Lot three, which is the one closest to the water, isn't actually tributary to the system, so they'd have to do their own thing anyway. Yep. So there is an impervious coverage calculation for lot one. That's on the subdivision documents. Yep. Um, on lot two, we are actually going above what we had previously assumed. So we're adding another row to the infiltration system to accommodate that increase. Okay. So in a future time when lot these other two, two other lots potentially could get developed, Will there be restrictions, at max restrictions? This guy's taking up more. Yeah, it's not a. It's not a. Yeah, it's not a restriction. It's, if they stay under, they don't have to do anything for drainage. Yep. If they go over, now they, they have, have to do something to do on their lot. Their supplemental. Yeah, exactly. And prove that it, their that lot could handle that supplemental overflow. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. Um, so when you get into the development plans, I'll show you where that drainage ends up. You can see the stormwater pipe coming in from the street, which will also pick up lot one. Uh, this is another stormwater pipe coming in from the street, but basically that infiltration system is back here. We've got a, a kind of commercial grade oil grit separator. So all, all catch basins, all area drains have a hood to prevent floatables from going down the pipe. They have sumps so that solids settle out. Then this oil grit separator uh, at this location does what a catch basin sump does an order of magnitude better through uh, swirl concentration. So more, se more, settle, uh, more sediment will settle out there, more floatables will be trapped there. This is the infiltration system that captures the water quality volume, which is what you do on coastal properties. Um, and that will wick out through a sand filter, which is shown here. Um, and then overflows, which is if it rains enough to fill up this infiltration system, which is more than an inch, a quarter, inch and a half, um, overflows will come down to this head wall and this pipe here. This actually is the, it, one of the only meaningful changes between when we gave you the drawings in early June and today, and this was um, because of the Department of Public Works uh, drainage review, um, is instead of just having this overflow pipe um, fall out on a riprap splash pad to uh, dissipate the energy, we actually turn this whole thing into a level spreader. So water will actually spread out through this uh, riprap and um, flow out into the meadow over a wider area that's done to uh, minimize the opportunity for uh, erosion in large storm events. So um, uh, Darren Ostfine uh, did provide his positive endorsement by email yesterday. So there's an email in the file now from Darren uh, dated July 18th saying he's comfortable uh, with that revision to the drainage design. All of his other comments really uh, were related to we're, we're kind of boilerplate standard things that will end up in uh, your resolution. Um, we also received a very thorough report so that, um, from Rick Talamelli, land use staff member, uh, who analyzed the proposal for uh, floodplain compliance under Section 820. Uh, we met with Mr. Talamelli yesterday. We met with Mr. Talamelli today uh, so that we understood exactly what he needed, um, and we actually have already updated our plans, uh, both site civil plans and architectural plans, um, to meet his requirements. Um, so you can include, comply with his memo in your resolution, that's fine, uh, but know that we've actually already met with him and already done that work uh, to prove that we were, in fact, compliant with the flood. That's plan. his memo dated July 11th, right? That's correct. Got it. Um, so uh, we looked at uh, coastal resources just to make sure we didn't need 
uh, a coastal site plan review cam. Um, you will see on uh, this, so let's do it on the simpler one, go up, um, off the property to the east and south uh, is a tidal wetland, but that tidal wetland is located about 140 feet from the closest residential improvements. So pursuant to your regulations, a coastal uh, a special permit site plan application is not, is not required uh, under, under 810. Um, but mind you, we're doing all the right things anyway. <laughs> Doesn't much matter. Um, other sections we have to comply with in your regs, section 870, which is sediment and erosion controls to make sure when the site is disturbed during construction that there aren't uh, impacts downstream, in this case to the resources, as downstream doesn't really go to any other property owners. Um, and then section 880, which is your stormwater management regulation, but I've, I've walked you through that and I've walked you through uh, the fact that we have uh, that design approved by your uh, Department of Public Works. I think, at the end of the day, uh, that's about it. Um, if you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, the number of bedrooms and square footage of the house, do you have that handy? We have. Uh, I'll repeat it. Yeah, you can repeat it. For <laughs> I'll repeat it if you it's quick. <coughs> Just tell us a little bit about the house. Yeah, for the record, Dan Conlon. It's, it's a five bedroom house, approximately 6,000 square feet. That's two and a half stories? Yes. Correct. Is that C O N L I N? C O N L O N. Thank you. Uh, is there any finished basement, lower level, nothing like that? No, it's not allowed in the flood zone. It's just crawl zone. space. Okay. What else? Um, and how many bathrooms? Five bathrooms, too? It's all, and again, this is all town water, town sewer. Correct. So all of your drainage work you're doing is really just for stormwater and rain, but not. That's correct. Did you say the number of bathrooms or are you right down? Five. Five? Five and five, okay. Um, let's start on this end this time. Jim Rand, any questions, sir? No, sir, I'm okay. Jeff Ball? Looks good now. George Riley? Just uh, quickly on the phasing of the roadway construction, what, what is the plan yeah. for that, that driver? Uh, so the road construction will start in August and will last about nine months, and the house construction will start a month or two after we get uh, your decision and will last about 15 months. So the road will be in place, you know, six months to a year before we're looking for a CEO on the house. And again, this is a private low-use road, right? So it's yeah, low-volume local residential, yeah. For the subdivision regs. Okay. And will be covered by, uh, by asphalt. So most of the most of the um, most of the drive most of that common drive is uh, asphalt. When you approved it, uh, you let us actually you gave us a waiver so we didn't have to go as wide as normal. So we were able to narrow it a little bit so we didn't have to put as much asphalt down. Uh, but we do have to do some stabilized shoulders on the edges to satisfy the fire marshal. Um, and uh, the end of the road, which is in this kind of half cul-de-sac, uh, is going to be permeable pavers. What's the uh, distance from the street to the house? It's probably uh, the near water lane or this street. So off of near water from near water all the way to yeah. that first house. I think th the common drive is about 800 feet long. And is that, or is there a hydrant going in there somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a hydrant uh, that's going to be placed near the coldest. Uh, where is it? No, actually, the hydrant's 400 feet in. The hydrant's about right here. So they're still laying in another 450 to 500 feet? Probably about 400 feet, yep. And the house will be fully sprinklered uh, okay. because we didn't have the fire flow available to not have it fully sprinkled. Just for the record, the, the next house that's further, I want to say, east, Right, which is lot, what, three? Oh, this one. Yeah, lot three over here, yeah. So that's going to be more than, for, from your from your hydrant, yeah. that's more than 400 feet, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. But we, we, knew, we knew all this when we did the subject. Yeah, I just want to hear Yep. Okay. You want to get ready? Yep. What's that? <laughs> it's good. He's, he's the one that has to know. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the other, the other is existing house, do we get that from the same driveway today? Uh, so the existing house actually goes through a different common drive right here. 
Okay. Uh, this is how you access uh, this house today through this common drive. So that goes on the other side of the King residence. Yep, exactly. Okay. I, I drove down there the other day and I could have sworn uh, there was a house in back. If you drove across the front top drive and went down there is is that is that depicted now this is the, this is the neighbor's house and they and they recently the new, it's a newer construction yeah the yeah they recently one. built this house uh, got a coastal site plan approval a couple of years ago to build to rebuild this house and uh their uh their good relationship between the two he's very excited to see the roadway get built because right now it's a dirt road with a yep. big puddle right here yep <laughs> And they're not considered an abutter because they the land. It's a technicality. They got they got the mailing anyway. Yep. Um, anyone within 100 feet of the big property, we ended up sending the mailing to just to be safe. Um, but technically, they don't abut lot two. And, and would you mind just putting your cursor on where that giant drainage gallery will be in relation About to here. right around there? Okay. Yep. So all the water flow, et cetera, is not going towards. Potentially, if there's any miscalculations. Well, we'll eventually, you know, water flows downhill, right? So yep. today, yep. water, you know, from a lot of these areas comes down and flows through this, yep. this tidal wetland. Yep. So that's where it wants to go at the end of the day. Our job is to make sure that uh, we clean it up and we get uh, uh, at least an inch of it into the ground to maintain groundwater recharge and cooling. Um, and really, all we let go is overflow from large storms. Got it. Got it. Okay. And that's why you have the level spreader and the rip prep and all that yep. stuff. To, to to deal with the large events. Yep. What if that's not Holly Pond, is it? What's that water? That's that's the Darien River or the gut. It's we're up we're upstream of uh, the boat club. Okay, it's up gut got it. Yeah, top uh, is there pasture loops around. Yeah, I might all even those be able new to constructions on pasture <clears throat> right yeah. up there. On the Doo -doo -doo. further up. I got you, I got Jeff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That helps. We're here, and of course, the yeah. one thing that is helpful to see is not loading. So there you go. <laughs> okay. oh, there we go. Yep. Um, anybody in the general public like to speak to this application? Anybody in the general public like to speak to this application? <clears throat> no, I guess those are the owners, so they're not going to speak to it. That's fine. Um, anything we're missing, Jeremy or Fred? Okay, and this one we can close it. Any closing remarks, Craig? You good? Uh, nope, no closing remarks. Thank you. Um, Your time. With that said, I would enter a motion to close the hearing. Right Amy makes the motion. Jeff makes the second. <clears throat> All those in favor? Great. We are going to deliberate this uh, maybe tonight? I don't know. Maybe tonight. Because these guys want to put the road in August. We would love to build sooner than later. So if there's any magical way that that happens before your August break, that's fantastic. Um, but, you know, we understand you have a busy docket. Do you need us for the um, to start the road? No, we can start the road. You can start the road right now, right? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. All right, let me clear my deck here. Get this off the deck. One, two, three. Good job, Craig. Thank you. It does make it easy. Cool. Okay, um, that is the end of the public hearing. Excuse me for this evening. Now we're going to go into the general meeting. The first item on the general meeting is discussion of accessory dwelling units, ADAs, uh, ADA, ADUs. I'm sorry. Um, public Act number, Public Act 21-29. In our packets, we got this pink packet of information. Um, dealing with the timeline and also um, the law as it's written and a couple other items including a letter from Francis uh, Pickering and who's presenting this Jeremy Mr. Keating good evening outside consultant giving us helping out with planning zoning welcome sir good evening my name is Dave Keating I'm the former zoning enforcement officer and assistant director of planning here in Darien. And I've been working with Jeremy and Fred on zoning issues as a consultant. And so I'm gonna be speaking tonight about these accessory dwelling units or accessory apartments as they're referred to in the state statutes. 
Um, we'll try to get you a copy of this PowerPoint presentation tomorrow. Um, I'm going to go through it very quickly just to kind of cover some of the topics because the purpose of tonight's discussion is to hear from you on what actions you want the staff to take. The purpose is not to hear from me, so we'll, we need to get your input and your direction. Um, the accessory dwelling units or accessory apartments as they're referred to in the state statutes go by a number of different names, but per Connecticut stat state statutes, accessory apartments means a separate dwelling unit that A, is located on the same lot as a principal dwelling unit of greater square footage, and B, has cooking facilities, and C, complies with or is otherwise exempt from any applicable building code, fire code, and health and safety regulations. Uh, there are a number of pros and cons with accessory dwelling units. It in, they increase the housing selection and affordability for renters. It improves the property maintenance due to sources of income for the property owners. It increases the resale value of property because the property is now an income generator. Um, and accessory apartments that are allowed as of right under Public Act 21-29 do not count in the calculation of the 10% goal of affordable housing. That is normally every dwelling unit that we add in the community goes into the denominator, denominator of that calculation and it counts against us. Uh, but accessory apartments allowed per the statutes don't. Does it go into the numerator? Pardon? Does the, do the ADUs go into the numerator? The numerator, the top number? No, because they're not necessarily affordable as okay. defined by the state statutes. And they probably would not be affordable in Darien's housing market. Um, some other impacts would include the increase in on-street traffic, I'm sorry, on-street parking, traffic congestion, and site crowding. Uh, the site crowding is of the individual sites with buildings and structures and so forth. It increases the use of public sewers and water facilities, increases the demand on emergency services and town services. Not that accessory apartments are a problem in that sense, but if you increase the number of dwelling units for single family houses, apartments, anything, it just logically increases the impact on the emergency services and town services. And it could potentially change the character of the residential properties and neighborhoods. Accessory dwelling units can be either detached structures or attached to the building. They can be part of the existing building or part of an addition. They can be over and above existing garage. They could be in a basement. Uh, they could be a conversion of a garage, but that leads to a problem as far as on-site parking, or they could be an addition to an existing structure on the second floor. Now, Public Act 21-29 has a very specific requirement for the Planning and Zoning Commission to take an action. Yes? With regards to, if you go back to the other side, does the accessory dwelling unit have to have its own front door? For the state statutes, no. The definition basically is just an additional dwelling unit. If you, uh, if you opt out of the state mandatory provision and you write your own regulations, then you could uh, require some kind of a definition as to where the entrance is. Is it visible from a, another neighboring property? Does it have to face the front street? And then it looks like a duplex structure as opposed to a single family structure. Uh, but just in general, that would not be something that the state wants to be an imposition just because it's a second dwelling unit on the property. Okay, let me just take it to the next step. I went to a house in Row Eighton. There was a, a top floor, <coughs> quote unquote, bedroom that had its, own, had its own kitchen. So that could be an accessory dwelling. To get to that top floor room, you had to go through the first floor of the house, the second floor of the house, and, the, and to the third floor of the house. Yes, and it depends on some, how somebody wants to design their unit and on the building code. Uh, there were many, many times that people wanted uh, to have an in-law apartment, uh, and I had to explain to them they could not have an apartment. They could have an in-law suite, they could have bedroom, a bathroom, a living space for the parents, but there'd be only one kitchen in the whole house 
and so there'd be no second kitchen. And so there was no need in that case for a separate or lock-off uh, area. If it's going to be an accessory apartment where somebody is paying rent to be there. But you don't have to pay, my grandmother's not going to pay rent, but I mean, that's, you keep putting the money rent into it, my college kid doesn't necessarily have to have, is going to pay rent. But the separate kitchen is, is, the def, is the difference between the apartment and the suite. Yes, in my mind, that's the big, big factor, yes. Yeah, that's why your first time we can talk about it after is we'll we get to that later, but keep going, you're doing great. Good. <clears throat> So under the Public Act, the Planning and Zoning Commission has big decisions to make. The first decision is, do you want to adopt regulations to allow accessory apartments? And, the, and if you don't, then the state statute standards take effect. And you can't write any additional statute, any additional regulations after January 1st of 2023. So do you want to write your own regulations for the state statutes? and adopt those and have them in effect by the end of this calendar year? Or do you want to opt out of this requirement under the statute? And in order to opt out of the statute, you need to have at least a two-thirds vote by the Planning and Zoning Commission and at least a two-thirds vote by the RTM. And those have to be completed by the end of this calendar year. No extensions, no, uh, no further deadlines beyond that. If there's no action by the commission to either adopt your own regulations or opt out completely, then the state statute applies and you cannot have any additional standards other than those statutes. Yes? Dave, if, if we go down the road of trying to opt out and it does not carry by the RTM by two-thirds majority, then it, we, get, we then default to the state's statute. Right, so assuming the Planning and Zoning Commission wants to opt out, yep. Unanimously, and the art and 65% of the RTM wants to opt out. It's not a two-thirds vote, so it's not a. It does not fulfill the state requirement to opt out. And then the Planning and Zoning Commission is back to option one, which is you either adopt your own regulations or you live with the state statute. And how is this slightly over. different than the parking requirements? Because the Can parking, you? the parking requirements that we opted out of um back last october it the commission wrote their own parking regs they wanted to opt out uh, it did it did carry by the rtm but we, the commission had already made reg, regulation changes prior to that Simil already, same process but right, you so, already opted out of the general parking requirements for accessory apartments it very specifically says the Parking requirement will be no more than one parking space for a no, studio and a one-bedroom. I think what she's asking is the mechanics bedroom. of the mechanics. I'm asking about the mechanics, the mechanics yeah. Mechanics of what's the difference between this opt-out and the parking opt-out? So say, say we do make our own ADU regulations. We want to then, we still have to trigger an opt-out. Mm -hmm. So ours will carry. It, RTM carries the vote, then ours stand. We make ADUs. We want to opt out. It does not carry. Does ours stand, or does it? Our, the, what we decide to put as ADU regulations get totally wiped if the RTM doesn't carry it. Then the state regulations carry. Yes. Yeah. I, it's a long question, but yes, the state statute would carry that. So the state statute carries if it doesn't carry the RTM, regardless of what we do as a commission and put our own policies in place. But the only the only thing I could say to add to that is, we did the parking well in advance yeah. of the state. Yeah. I think in this instance, and correct if I'm wrong, Jeremy, we're not going to have time to do our own ADUs. I would say yeah. before the state we can adopt timeline something. kicks in. We, we don't. We, I mean, even if it doesn't carry, it doesn't matter because yeah. ours wouldn't would get, wouldn't be held up. It would get over, it would get overridden or okay. overruled. It's, it's an excellent question, Amy and Dave and I were just. Uh, talking about that. So right now, the town of Darien has no accessory dwelling unit provisions. So you're correct, if we do adopt, there's a provision in this statute, that if we do adopt a provision and do not opt out, our provision would stand because we would have something on the books. Um, so your question is a good one. If we have something on the books, would the states then impose theirs? And the answer would be no. 
Got it. But, uh, of, of course, the reason we're here tonight is we're already in the second half of 2022. So uh, time, time flies, and Dave and I were kidding about that a little bit earlier. And as you know, the RTM schedule, especially as you get late in the year, becomes a little dicey. So uh, you can see on the pink sheets, we've kind of aimed for the RTM meeting in October if the commission decides to proceed with the opt-out. That's really our goal, is to get it to the RTM for a vote on their regularly scheduled October 17th meeting, uh, rather than requesting that they schedule a special meeting in November or December, especially in light of the fact that sometimes the RTM turns over in November. Yep. So we're, we were really working backwards from that October RTM meeting, which means it needs to get to rules by, on or about October 1st, yep. which is, you know, 90 days from today, basically, 75 days from today. <clears throat> and, you, and you don't have an August meeting. Um, but it, it, to, to further the thought, we're not going to have time between now and October 17th to make up our own ADUs thing. So ours going to... Or is it going to be after this? Well, between now and then, we could certainly draft regulations and have them in the works and have them have a public hearing on them. That'd be great. And if the commission and the RTM then decide to opt out, then the commission can say, okay, we're not going to adopt those regulations. But if the RTM chooses not to opt out, then at least we will we'll have taken those proper steps so that in November or December, the Planning and Zoning Commission could adopt those regulations instead of just allowing the state statutes to govern. And ours the would be superior or, or trumped or whatever you want to call it, priority to, above the state. If we, as a commission, pass ADU regulations, then that will be the prevailing regulation only if we opt out. Only if. No, that's what I'm trying to get at. If that's the opt out doesn't opt carry, out. but if the opt out doesn't carry, does the default what we've approved, or then the state overrides what we've approved? Then the state overrides. That's what I'm trying to get at. The state overrides. It's yeah, the state overrides. In general, the state statutes always override local decisions. And when the uh, Public Act 21 29 was passed, Part of the regulations that you have for affordable, uh, for accessory apartments, it lists a number of things that you can do. It lists a number of things that you cannot do. So for example, you cannot require that these accessory apartments be affordable. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. cannot require somebody who's got a non-conforming building location to correct that location in order to convert it into an accessory apartment. Yep. So you, you, even if you wrote, wrote your own regulations, you cannot disregard those state statutes. But you could make regulations that say, here's the parking regulations and here's the... One of the issues that we have for DREN that I see is that our zoning regulations, our, I still feel like I work for the town. Um, you are. The DREN zoning regulations do require that the each dwelling unit have two on-site parking spaces. And that those parking spaces have to be at least nine feet wide, at least 18 feet deep, and have an, at least a 24-foot backup turnaround area that's unobstructed by any other parking spaces or any buildings or structures or landscaping or anything else. And they also require that the required two parking spaces per dwelling unit comply with the front yard setbacks and the side yard setbacks. The regulations say you can have extra parking in the driveway. It doesn't count as part of the required two spaces. Uh, and you can have extra parking spaces on the side of your garage in the side yard, but it doesn't count as one of the required parking spaces. One of the goals of the housing advocates is to say convert garages into dwelling units. And it's an easy way to make an accessory apartment. And we, we've done a better job historically of providing housing for our vehicles than we have for our people. 
And so getting rid of garages and making them into dwelling units is, in their mind, a great thing. The problem is that, for the Darien zoning regulations, that just complicates the requirement for on-site parking. And we need to figure out, do we want to grant an exception for that if it's an accessory apartment? Do we want to enforce that rule strictly? Do we want to reduce the number of parking spaces? Do we want to make it some other, other arrangement? An another difficulty that we're going to have if we allow accessory apartments in detached accessory structures is that in several of our residential zones, for at least the past 50 years, we have allowed detached accessory structures for garages and for storage and for utilities. And those detached structures have a much reduced setback area, sometimes just five feet from the side lot line and rear lot line. The argument will be made that those should be able to be converted into accessory apartments. But they don't have the proper footings, they don't have the proper foundation to meet the building code, so they're going to basically have to be completely rebuilt in order to have insulation, utility hookups, proper foundation. But we need to deal with that affirmatively and assertively rather than just let people make the argument, well, that structure has been there and the state statute says it's non-conforming and you cannot require compliance uh, correction of a non-conformity in order to uh, allow an accessory apartment. So, so those are just some of the issues that I see, but really the commission needs to direct staff as to do you want to opt out? And I think that would be the best thing to do because then you can always adopt regulations later on after January 1st of 2023. And I think the commission also needs to work on draft regulations and hold a public hearing on draft regulations just in case that opt-out procedure does not work. That's my opinion, but I'm not a policymaker. I'm not an elected official. You are. No, so, but it's, it's, we always listen to staff's opinion and outside consultants that are, are here in front of us. Um, okay, you good? You done? Yep. Anything yep. else? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. finished, and the, I'll be glad to answer any questions, and Jerem, we can all right, let me have get, this as a discussion. And. With, regards to, with regards to going back, the, we, we opted out of the parking regulation, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was passed unanimously? It was. The RTM, the, R, the RTM approved what we did unanimously on our maintaining of local control and what we did with the parking, so we must have done but, a good job. But I will say, as the chair of planning, zoning, and housing, it was very uh, a logical case for me to shepherd the group and the body through the work that was done by the commission prior and your thought process and setting your own public, your own pro parking re regulations. So I'm, I'm in agreement with Dave that I do think, I know we're pressed against time, but I do think it's, it's an important part of the, ask of the RTM to say we're we're rolled up our sleeves and we're diving into what we think is best for Darien and this is our thought process and this is our draft and this is our you know so you so so they have something to understand okay so let's let's just check the count before I give my two second speech or two minute speech with regards to timeline between now and the rules committee uh, meeting that we're talking about where this would be assigned, do we have sign? Do we have time to start to draft our own re regulations between now and then? Yeah, because that, that's what you're asking for. Yeah, right. I, I, ideally. Because we were done, 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 done before it yeah. went the rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeremy Ginsburg, Director of Land Use. I think that's one reason we came to you this evening, is it gives staff and their consultants the ability to, over August break, think about the framework, such that as a fallback. Uh, when we do present to the RTM, we could say, look, here's the types of issues that need to be addressed. And the state has given us a very short time frame to address them. So what we're asking for is, an, to the RTM presumably, is an opt-out to give the commission time to hash through these issues of parking, where the front door is, uh, fire safety access, do these have to be sprinklered, what are the appropriate setbacks? Do we want to allow them in sewered areas, septic? How, you know, these are issues that need to be considered. 
I know uh, one thing, uh, one slide Dave didn't get to was, you know, what are other communities doing? Again, the, the state statute affects every community in the state. Uh, we've been in contact, as you saw in the chart we gave you with Westcog, over what other communities have done. Some, a very few communities ha already have ADU or accessory apartment regulations. I think that's really one step for us to start looking into. But as you can see, a majority of communities so far have said they are likely to opt out or in the, are in the opt out process. Uh, we'll circle back to Westcog to uh, find out more. But as Dave said, we'd, we'd recommend the, for the time being, the dual track of proceeding with the opt out and proceeding with us starting to do some legwork and investigative work as, as a fallback to have something, if needed, if the RTM vote is not to opt out, to at least have something to fall back on so we have something on the books before January 1st. Okay. Um, this, this is kind of where I see this. I want to be able to maintain local control for the town of Darien. We've done a great job doing it and all of our stuff. If we opt out, which is what my recommendation is, we can maintain local control and, um, and draft our own uh, accessory dwelling unit um, statute. I, I do think accessory dwelling units is a good thing. I've told the story once or twice. Um, when I graduated college, I lived in the quote unquote basement of my parents' house in what I called 56A. It did not have a kitchen, but you know, I was right out of college and I went out to dinner every night anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had my own front door, my own bathroom, and I guess I really didn't have a parking space because I blocked in my dad and he got mad. Um, um, I think that in, in our town, in two acre lots, I think it's, it's very easy to have an accessory dwelling unit inside. We already have a lot of pool houses in town. Some of those pool houses have, um, kitchen, have bathrooms. Some of them have kitchens without a stove. Uh, which doesn't make it a kitchen. They might have a coffee maker and a toaster oven, and they, I don't know if they have a dishwasher or not, but we already have those in two acre lots in pool houses. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd have to look hard um, deeper on one acre lots if those would be quote unquote as of right. But I personally do not want, um, without us looking at it, accessory dwelling units inside a one fifth acre lot because I think there's gonna be a parking issue um, and, and I think it's going to be really tight. I also um, have an issue having, I live in a one third acre lot and I think it'd be very hard to, cr to create an apartment at my house um, that, has, that meets all the setbacks. We also don't have any overnight parking on streets. There is a neighborhood in Greenwich that I've done work in that has a bunch of accessory dwelling units and at night the streets are filled with cars because no one can park any place. We do not have any on street parking during the winter months. My daughter parked my Jeep in front of our house last night, but that's not the winter months um, because we had, I think, the post 53 car in my driveway. But in the winter time when there's, when there's snow plowing, we don't want to have cars in the streets. Um, one of the issues when this whole thing was going <coughs> public way back when is they wanted to make it as of right because people couldn't afford the application fee or the special permit fee. I think it'd be great to have these things by special permit. The special permit fee in our town, I think, is five hundred dollars, even less. It's a, was it four fifty or two fifty? Something yeah, it's like about that. two hundred fifty dollars. Covers the cost of legal notices, uh, other incidental out of pocket costs for the town. I mean, I, I think if that's an issue for, you know, a an older person um, that's their only, the only expense they have is, is their taxes. You know, I would even, you know, if we draft our own resolution, I would waive the application fee or waive the special permit fee. So it doesn't cost them $250 or $100 for the application fee to do all that stuff. Um, I, think, I think I want the applicant, like my, my father's got a house in a one fifth acre zone. I want him to be able to prove that he can convert his garage into an apartment and have parking coming out. Dave went over some of the parking regulations where you have to have two spaces that to be able to get to the street. We do have tandem parking in town. There's tandem parking at the Heights, which is also officially known as Alan O'Neill. Um, but most of those tandem slots go for the two parking spaces for the one apartment. 
you don't have tandem, you know, in 56A, he's got the front tandem space, and 56B, he's got the back tandem space because one guy's going to work, is blocked him. That doesn't work for us. Um, I also, and I thought about this again, because when you brought it up, and I, I, I really like having Jeff here because the chances of having two fires or kitchens in a house doubles the possibility of a fire. My daughter was babysitting the other day, set up the fire alarm. The fire department showed up. Now you have two houses with two kitchens and two possibilities where the fire alarm can go off in the kitchen. You know, I'd like to look at that. The other thing that you just mentioned is, you know, people have sheds that are, it's a shed that was dropped off by Walpole that doesn't have a foundation, that's five feet off the property line, you can convert that but it doesn't have a foundation, it has no electricity, and we're gonna convert those into places with kitchens without P and Z looking at it? Yes, the, the building department would look at it because that's a requirement for mechanicals and plumbing and all that stuff, but I, I think that the P and Z look, would have to look at it and prove that it works. Um, you know, it, it, and, and if, the, if any of the argument against it being as of right or not as of right, it comes down to the application to put it, someone to put an application into us and to pay the $250 for the special permit or the $100 for the application fee. It's, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a big number. I, I also, I don't, don't take it the wrong way, Dave, but in your first slide, when you talked about it, it provides income for the people and it provides, you know, income for this, you know, I, I, can, put my, I can put an accessory toilet unit in my house and give it to my kid. You know, you know, there's a house that's being built in, um, you know, down in the bay. They've got 10 children. You know, if they build a pool house and you can put apartments there, you're not charging your 15-year-old rent to live in the pool house. You know, so it's not, it doesn't necessarily bring, it doesn't necessarily provide additional income. When they did pass it in the town of Fairfield, all the older um, people that had houses that were basically, they paid off their mortgage after 30 years, you know, that's an assumption that they love the income to help them pay the rent. I get that. You know, there's a woman in my office that has that. She'd love to rent a, a room in her house and she lives in Wilton. Um, so having to be able to come to the Planning and Zoning Commission with your plans, with your parking, with your layout, and have it, them show to us, that is, I don't think that's a big ask. I would rather have us look at it in advance than have somebody, you know, just do it without us seeing it and it comes in later. Um, I welcome anybody else's thoughts on this. Um, well, I can start with Jim on this. Uh, actually, we'll start with Amy on this end because we started Jim last time. Um, I, I agree that, Dave, that you, the top issues are the parking and some of these accessory dwelling units, uh, our accessory structures are very, can be very close to side lot lines. Um, and then I also, just with, with regards to, and I don't know what the regulations are, with regards to um, people enrolling children into the school system with a, you know, kind of a rental. Um, uh, just, just legit, are these legitimate rentals that, you know, that we're gonna have and not, a, not an opportunity for um, a grandmother to enroll their children in Darien school systems because they're renting this out to somebody else and are they truly residents? Uh, and year rental leases um, uh, on these on these dwelling units. How is that going to be? Is it going to be informal, or are we going to have actual leases um, that satisfy residents' requirements for all the services that come with the town? That's an, another thought. Thank you. George. Thoughts? Um, I am happy to associate myself with your comments and yours, uh, Amy. Uh, local control, I know, is what brought you here. Uh, we have commented on it before as we dealt with some of these issues, and it remains paramount. Uh, that has been a tradition for Darien since uh, before its charter was adopted, and uh, that's really as it should continue, I, I certainly <coughs> believe. And, and uh, two things, you know, um, just looking at their, uh, the new statute, it provides that uh, uh, the uh, we can adopt uh, adopt pursuant to this statute uh, designating locations or zoning districts within the municipality which accessory in which accessory apartments are allowed 
provided at least one accessory apartment shall be allowed as of right on each lot that contains a single family dwelling. Does that mean that every zone gets to have a uh, unit as of right? Yeah. And then we get to designate other zones in which there can be more than just that one. I guess it is the latter. Um, I'm seeing you two thinking of that, but I can see some ambiguity there uh, and uh, some some issue behind it. Um, the only other thing but I've thought of to, that happens yeah. to be a, a notion of mine that having one of these ADUs actually in front of the principal residence, given the fronted, you know, the, the front yard offset uh, setback, uh, strikes me as, as universally odd. And, and uh, I, would, I would not want to see that happen. And as far as I can tell, there's no, nothing in this, these regulations that would prohibit that. And that's something I would like to incorporate in any regulations we did, just as an example. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm with you. Okay, thank you. Jeff? I'm glad that you all asked your questions. I'm good for now. Jim Rian? Um, this whole discussion um, impresses me in two ways. One, I think we have to remain our masters of our own destiny insofar as we can. Uh, and, and that means um, uh, putting together our own rules and regulations about how this is to be implemented. The second thing that impresses me is <coughs> some of the comments have been general in nature and some of them have been what the rules should say once we adopt them, um, which I don't think was our intention this evening. But. No. Uh, if we do take the opt-out route and uh, <coughs> work on our own, <coughs> our own regulations, uh, <coughs> me, the, the discussion su suggests that it's going to involve a hell of a lot of work on the part of the commission <laughs> uh, and the staff. September. And yeah. uh, I think if we're going to do it, we have to commit ourselves, I guess. I can't speak for myself, but I think the commission has to has to um, <coughs> commit itself to spend the hours necessary to get this done. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. Um, so I think we heard from all five commissioners. Just let me just take a straw poll. You're an opt out, yes. Yeah. Opt out, yes. Yeah. Opt out, yes. Opt out, yes. Yes. Opt out, yes. So there's there's the the commission's view of this um I, I think the next step from where we're hearing and and amy I, I i really appreciate your insight that when it goes to the when it goes to the rules committee which is the next step because it goes to the rules committee then the rules committee has to assign it to the different things so for argument's sake it's going to be assigned to um planning housing uh, planning zoning housing pz and h they want amy's suggestion or the success from last time was she had something tangible in her hand that said this is what Daring it already did and it was also that and since that document was also helped out by Craig Flaherty who's a professional land planner um, I also consider Dave Keating as a professional land planner he's been doing it probably older than my age hmm. um, I hope <laughs> um, so if you guys can do that during August we can noodle with it in September that it's ready to go, whatever that October meeting is on your on your time on your time schedule. Yeah, I think. Um, I, thank you, Steve. I, I think that's super helpful to us. Is the feedback we just got from the commission, both on the opt out and the hey, have something in your back pocket to start walking us down that road. Jim Rand's right on the money. This this is not a simple 15 minute thing. No. This is many issues, as Dave acknowledged. Many issues need to be discussed considered, analyzed. So we're gonna start that work at the same time, working towards the opt-out. And the calendar we put up on the screen, we'll be back before you in September to talk more about this and kind of give you an update at that time. The only closing item I just wanna make sure I add to say in the public is if we, if we, it's my recommendation eventually we approve accessory dwelling units. But as Dave reiterated, some of these pool house apartments 
you know, can be bigger than my house. You know, so it, it's the, when this thing was drafted by, and I think one of the proponents, and I'm not, you know, good throw anybody under the bus, but when desegregated Connecticut proposed this way back when, they thought all these accession roads would be low rentals. You know, if you get a, a um, house on Long Neck Point that's got a cottage and you can rent it out to somebody, you know, that's not, it's not $1,000 a month. It's not 500 bucks a month. So this is not really necessarily affordable apartments or accessory apartments that either you can get no rent from it if it's going to be my kid or my college kid or my recent college graduate or Jeff's daughter when she gets out of college lives in my garage um, or it could be someone that you know just has a small apartment so it's not necessarily going to be affordable um, so I think we gave you enough direction right yes fantastic yep. all right so I think we're done with this we can move on to the next item on the agenda good thank you very much good. really fantastic. appreciate it great thank you thank you, thank you David nice to meet you thank you great seeing you Dave uh, and we can get copies of that PowerPoint eventually? Yes, they're going out in tomorrow's emails to everyone. Fantastic. All right. Next item on the agenda, deliberation possible decisions on the following. Proposed amendments to the Darien Zoning Regulations, COZR number 3-2022, put forth by FR Darien LLC. I'm going to read the whole thing because there's a, there's a reason why we get to it. Um, pr proposal to amend section 210 of the Darien Zoning Regulations to clarify definitions relative to co-working space and medical spas. Proposal to amend section 742 of the Darien Zoning Regulation to now allow office uses to occupy up to 20% of the gross floor area of buildings in the Norton Heights Zoning, Norton Heights Business Zone and H Zone. As of right permitted, as, as an as of right permitted principal use, including on the first floor. These sentences are really long. We gotta do something about this. <laughs> it's a yeah, fifth time today. Somewhere. They're just barely kind. Go up for breath. <laughs> Proposal to amend section 743 of the Darien Zoning Regulations to eliminate business and professional offices as a principal use uh, requiring a special permit. The full text of the proposed zoning regulation amendments is uh, are on file and available in the town clerk's office and the planning and zoning office for inspection and online at darienct.viewpointcloud.com. The first thing is, is the 20% that I just read in the initial notice um, has been changed. Um, in the proposal, if you can remember, it's only 10%. It's also not any more buildings it's building complex, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, so you couldn't have 20% of a small building, which is effectively 10,000 feet. And then the last item that was that was deleted is the second half, where it says Darien's only regulation to eliminate business professional offices as prin principal use requiring a special permit. That aspect of the proposal got dropped. Um, so in our packets, we have a draft resolution dated July 12, 2022. 2022. The first paragraph deals with exactly what we just, what I just spoke about, where it says 20% across for our area and that the office use is not required by special permit. So if you th read through the document, um, it introduces on the back page at the end, um, which is page three, it puts in the definition of a building complex, which is any a group of building that exceeds 100,000 square feet. Um, it also puts in the co-working issue. Then on the next page. I don't think I don't we have that's it. What you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, you got, everyone got this email to them on Thursday by Fred. Mm -hmm. So you did not get a draft packet in your, you did oh, not get a draft okay. document in your packet. No, I'm afraid I got two of them for 237 Long Night Point. Correct, mm -hmm. yeah, you, in your package you got two draft documents um, that are stamped draft, and on Friday, you got these email. To, on Thursday, you get email to everybody. Okay. Um, so either I can pass mine around and show it to you, but it's it, the the meat of the of the crux of the meat is in the last section, and that's what I'm kind of sort of going over right now. Okay. Um, so it, it at the beginning it talks about that and all our, our standard stuff. The, this, the um, commission did its review finding. This adjustment is consistent with the town, 2016 Town Plan of Conservation Development um, that we did. It talks about the original proposal 
with all the changes that we just spoke about and where it comes into the co-working space. And then on page two, which is proposal to modify sections um, 742, they proposed an, the modification, which goes to 10% um, of a building complex. And then um, not it's the original proposal call for 20%. That's what I just explained to everybody. Yep. Okay, then on page three, um, the now and therefore it be resolved is, that's the new wording that's in bold. The first item is in section 210. There's the definition of building complex. And we got this in our, in our packets the last go around. I think it was an addition by um, attorney, attorney Mike Murray. The business, I'm gonna read it. The business, uh, business and professional offices are inclusive of co-working mixed use spaces containing desks or other workspaces and facilities used by recognized memberships who share the premises. That's what's being added to section 210. Um, with regards to office medical and dental, uh, it talks about treatment of people on the ground floor. For the purpose of this definition, medical offices is considered to be inclusive of a medical spa, a facility under the supervision of a licensed physician, physician's assistant or advanced practice registered nurse and providing cosmetic medical services, including but not limited to cosmetic surgery hair transplants, cosmetic injections, cosmetic soft tissue filters, uh, laser hair removal, and laser skin treatment. See medical spas. That comes down to, lack of a better word, Botox, is what that stuff is that you could do in a medical spa. Why did spa. you look at me? <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm very sorry. That was not intentional. I'm just I just, I guess I'm did a lefty. I, mean, I, I looked at him, but. Uh, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> thank you. Um, but that's what that is. And, and now those items are allowed on second floors. We're, we're putting them on the first floors. Relative to that, if you remember, um, Mr. Murray, Attorney Murray, I don't know if it's an assistant or a paralegal, she was also an attorney. Terry Kribben, who worked with Mike Murray. Right, she worked on it. She researched what these people are. Um, and that's where it came up with the definition. She looked at the, re the definition. That's why it says, under supervision of a licensed physical physician, phys physician's assistants or advanced practice registered nurse. Uh, my wife's a registered nurse, but I don't think she's an advanced practice nurse. I don't know. Um, then at the end, medical office spas or med medical or dental offices on the first floor uses including building complex not to exceed 10 percent of the combined commercial floor areas of first floor building so for argument's sake if a complex is a hundred thousand square feet and we determine that this complex i think at on this if, if information they gave us is a hundred and was it one hundred seventeen thousand? that's the number i remember so it wasn't 177 i think it's once it's somewhere around one hundred twenty thousand square feet so in this instance they can have 12,000 square feet of combined uh, medical spas and dentist office and an urgent care type doctor's office on the ground floor. Um, okay, yes, Jen. And they can spread it around or com uh, combine it all in one place? Correct. Any, any, any way they want. Correct. 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 It can be one, 15, one 10,000 square foot unit or yeah. it can be a 5,000 and a 5,000. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Spread it around. Thanks. Um, Questions, comments on this? I know some people don't have this at their fingertips. You actually, I do. Uh, for the record, I am reading this. <laughs> 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 Want to see mine? If you. Um, yeah, I, I have a question with regards to parking. Does Go right ahead. parking re for medical locations have a higher use because it's a turnover, like it's an hourly appointments or thirty-minute appointments? I mean, I know it's only ten percent of the space. And if you do 10% of your 120,000, that's what 12,000, and the parking requirements are usually represented as per thousand. So, is there an incremental difference in parking that we need to be thinking about? The answer to the question is yes. There's a difference between parking for office, medical office, and also like um, like a, a gym. When the when the applicant did their proposal between when that resolution was approved mm -hmm. and where we are today, 
we lowered the parking requirement yep. for the apartments. Okay. So because it's a mixed use zone, they, they but I'm gonna make up the numbers a little bit. They were required to have 500, 500 parking spaces for the apartments and 500 parking spaces for the commercial. We allowed them to only, instead of having a thousand, we allowed them to only have 750. Mm -hmm. When we changed our parking for the apartments, um, they're not required to have 500 anymore. They're only required to have 400. So okay. now the delta is 900 versus 750. So your question is correct. There is a higher ratio. Yep. Um, most of these people do go by appointment. They are going to be subject to a special permit. So we will still see that like we do at Good okay. Wives. Okay. So well, in Good Wives, we, in, in a lot of instances, we make them space out the, mm -hmm. uh, the appointments. Mm -hmm. So you don't mm -hmm. have 15 people in the waiting room and there's a lot of people there and you know, it's a coming and a go. We yep. also count the number of chairs mm -hmm. you know, in a barber shop you know, and the number of beds in a spa. Um, but that's, I think I answered your question. And number of employees. Number of employees for parking spaces. Anything else? That was my main question was, well, would this impact, you know, the parking? George, any questions? Also. Jeff? I'm good, thank you. Jim? I'm good, good. The only thing I did find in here, and we, we started doing this a, a while ago, is um, this one spot where it says Mike Murray, and it doesn't say comma Esquire. Can we add the Esquire? It's on page three, paragraph 10. I don't know if you, this is, this is the part I don't know. It says attorney Mike Murray, I would add the Esquire. I know it's wrong to say Dr. You know, Stephen Ovan and comma MD. You're not supposed to do both. Are you supposed to do that? No. Can you do attorney Mike Murray comma Esquire? No, I shouldn't. You shouldn't? Right. Okay. Either one. Either one, so that's the same as Dr. MD. All right, forget it. And I think one thing we'll have to do, Steve, on this is correct the dates, because as you can see, we didn't get to it last week, so we'll have to put everything on for the 19th and then adjust the dates it goes in. I think it could still take effect, Fred, on the 31st. Uh, it does still give us time to put the legal notice in the paper next Thursday, the 24th, I believe that would be. Okay, so this resolution, it should be dated the 19th? Correct. Okay. And the, 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 Fred's correct, the newspaper legal notice would go in on, just checking my calendar here, the 28th. Okay. All right, so we're changing. Still before it goes into effect the Sunday after, so we, we still have that wiggle room. So we would just change the, uh, the date of action is going to be go from the 12th to the 19th. Yep. That's today's date, the 19th, right? Then the other one goes from the 21st to the 28th, whatnot? Correct. All right, so I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the resolution as amended. Is that correct? Yeah. Jim's Jim. making the motion, looking for a second. Amy's making a second. Um, all those in favor? Bingo. Thank okay. You. Done. Next item on the agenda. Um, this one was also emailed to everybody. This is the Country Club of Darien um, proposal. Amy, do, are you on this one? Um, no, I serve on the grounds committee for the Country Club of Darien, so I will not be voting on, on this. You want me to leave or just no, sit here quietly? No, she's fine. You can sit quietly. That's great. Um, again, so this one was emailed to you, so Amy is going to recuse herself from this vote. So it's one, two, three, four. We got four. We're good. Um, again, this was emailed to everybody. I'll just kind of go through it. The big, real quick item. Oh, I have to read it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 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 Um, the next item on the agenda is special permit application number 60R, site plan, comma, landfilling or greeting application number 121F, Country Club of Darien, 300 Mansfield Avenue. Proposal to make changes to the golf club's course by relocating the fifth hole and the 6T and the maintenance area to perform re and to perform related site development activities. This is the application where the maintenance facility is quote unquote next to a river. That's a river over there, right? Or wetlands. They're flipping the, the maintenance facility next to the wetlands to the <coughs> other side next to the maintenance road, which is closer to a neighbor's house. And they're moving the, the tee box over away from the neighbor's house and they're moving the, the green closer to the to the water. The whole reason why I think Mr. Flaherty who presented the application put this forth was they want to make the course harder. Um, so now if you miss the green you'll end up in the water. Correct. And if you if you hooked your tee shot off of the tee instead of going into the neighbor's front yard, 
you're a little bit further to the, I don't know, to the left or the right. Um, so we got in the, we got in a, a proposal in there. Um, it goes through everything on here. I read this thing. It doesn't. It's very short. It doesn't say a whole lot. Um, it's basically written up as an approval. Again, you get it on your email. Yep. Um, and did you have a chance to look at yep. it? You're good. Yep. And Jim, Jim you're good. Okay. Um, with that, so we have to adjust this one. We have to adjust all the dates again. Okay. So we're looking to looking for a motion to approve this as amended. Jeff's making a motion. Look for a second. Jim makes a second. All in favor? For Thank nothing. You. The cop club got their new tea box and greens. Um, this was also just for the record. The neighbors were signed off on it, um, and the neighbors on the club are going to work together with Bushes, I think. And that's kind of, that's in there too. All right. Next item on the agenda. Um, Coastal site plan review number 352A is an apple. Flood time version application number 429. Land filling and regrading application number 490A is an apple. 237 Long Neck Point Road, LLC at 237 Long Neck Point Road. Proposal to perform, to perform repair work to an existing seawall, construction of a new concrete terrace and steps. Proposal to construct and install new dock uh, consisting of a fixed pier ramp and platform and perform related site development activities within regulated areas. This is the house that is basically under construction on Lone Point. The applicant, um, and I forget the guy's name, the engineer. Tim uh, DeBartolomeo. What was his name? Mr. Tim DeBartolomeo of Sound Engineering Associates. I was thinking of a different guy. Okay. He was the presenter uh, that night. Tim. The application, they showed pictures of the seawall to the left, which is really good um, concrete covering and then our seawall, which is kind of worn out and um, falling apart, and then the one next to it. Um, the other thing that was part, was on here but was not on here was the, the dock. There's a spot for a dock. Um, the dock was moved, I think, one of the plans over to the, I'm going to say, I don't know, it was moved to the left a little bit. Um, and it goes out into the water. We did, that, was that part of this application? Maybe? Right. It's a two-part. It was a two-part well, application. The seawall repairs, as you've noted, and the dock. And Mr. DeBartolomeo made a number of representations at the hearing, which the commissions incorporated as conditions, in terms of uh, the large equipment not being left on the beach overnight, and how much work they'd be aiming to do at the seawall. Uh, that was that kind of their goal is to do the about 30 feet at a time of the seawall. So those have been incorporated. Otherwise, a pretty straightforward draft resolution. Yep, so when we got a draft resolution in their packets, questions, comments, typos, Scribner's errors, anything out here? Pretty straightforward, it's one of our shorter ones. Um, my, my comment would be, I think they were moving the dock away from the neighbor's dock, which was a yep. good thing to do. Yep, yep. And I, I watched this Vimeo, so I'm Maybe. in order prior. Thank you. Um, with that said, that's in a motion to approve as submitted. Yep. Jeff makes a motion. Looking for a second. That's fine. Yep. George, George got the second. He hasn't yeah, made, he has made the scorecard yet. He's very competitive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Yeah. Five, Five nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Next. All right. Next time on the agenda. Um, <clears throat> Coastal Site Plan Review number 369, Flood Time Prevention Application number 428, William and Abigail um, Hosberg at Six Pratt Island. Proposes to construct additions and make alterations to the existing single family residence, including construction of a two story addition to the garage and a one story addition to the southeast side of the house. Remove a portion of the flagstone patio in the front of the residence, install <clears throat> walk, walkways. Reloc relocate and elevate HVAC equipment and perform related site development activities within the regulated areas. The hearing closed on June 7, 2022. This is the house that was also um, had a bunch of nonconformities, and a lot of this application takes the nonconformities out of the mix and fixes them. The only thing they're adding, they're putting, I think, a second floor dormer, like the one that we saw today on the second floor, uh, for more stuff. So in your packet, you got a draft resolution. The application was um, presented by Wilder Gleason. Um, questions, comments, typos, scribbling errors from anybody on this one? Again, it's, it's, it's really good that they're taking stuff out of the flood zone. And I think at the end, all, they have to give us all their, there's no, 
They don't need to do an elevation survey, right? Because it's not. Well, survey. elevation certificate is one of the conditions of approval. That's uh, F2 on page five. Okay. Yep. Uh, prior to CFO, as built surveys, which we love. Um, and then the item two is the other one. Any questions, comments, and you watch this on TV? I'm going to abstain from oh, you this abstain one. I from did this not one. get a chance to get updated on this one. So we still have four people voting. Um, yeah, Fred and I talked about that. Um, any comments? Nope. Looking for a motion to approve as submitted. Jim Rand's making a motion. Looking for a second. Okay. George. Whose turn is it? George's turn. Huh? Got it. George got it. George seconded. All in favor? Four to zero, one abstention. Thank Four you. Four zero, one abstention. Fantastic. All right. Next item on the agenda. Deliberations in only regarding the following items. Time permitting with time is at 920. We're moving right along. Um, amendments to business site plan application number 296, special permit application number 296, land filling and regreening application number 409. Uh, FR Darien LLC, the Commons at Neroten Heights, proposed to amend the Commission's previous October 10, 2017 approval to allow office and medical and dental uses as a permitted uses, oh Jesus, as permitted uses on the first floor of buildings subject to percentage caps as to, as would be permitted by the proposed amendments to Darien Zoning Regulation COZR number 3-2022 put forth by the put forth by FR Darien LLC. I must be having a tough time today. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just passed a new regulation that allows you to put dentist office and dental, a dentist office and doctors on the ground floor. Now the, this was um, to allow that since the other one was passed. So we have to amend their resolution to permit that. And that's what this is. Okay. Okay, it was a, it was a second application. Um, you watch this one on TV, Amy? Yep. Great. Yep. Jim, any questions on this one, sir? No. Jeff? I'm good, thank you. George? What's up? Good. Good. Okay. Uh, can we instruct staff to write up a positive um, resolution on this one? Yep, we'll have it ready for next week. Have it next week? Great. Next item on the agenda. Proposed amendments to Darien Zoning Regulations, COZR number 1-2022, oh, one put forth by Hermerson 16 LLC, a proposal to add new section 597 to the Darien Zone Regulations to establish an age restricted age restriction within the Leroy West Affordable Housing Overlay LW zone that would require at least one, one occupant of every occupied dwelling unit to be 55 years of age or older. I recuse uh, the public hearing closed on. May 17th, 2022, decision that extended to July 27th, 2022. I recuse myself from this application, so I guess I should, maybe you should have read it. Oh, um, I don't think any harm in who reads it. All right, so I'm gonna step out and hand the mic over to um, Vice Chairman George um, Riley. I wanna be clear that three is a quorum, right? Oh. Uh, what you would have, Amy, I believe, has started in on her. I have, I oh, have. you've gone through it all? I have gone through oh, it all. Oh, okay. I've yep. I, 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 gone through it all. Okay. So that's good. Yeah, I gave Amy quite a list, and yeah, good. Right. God bless her for <laughs> sitting through all those There's hearings. Some I didn't get through, but <laughs> okay, yeah. Good um, thing the market's down. <laughs> so we did deliberate about this on one occasion, um, but we haven't heard from Amy on it. I think Jeff and Jim were generally dis inclined not to favor the amendment. Yes, that's correct. Correct. Okay. And Amy, do you have an opinion on that? Um, I generally feel the same way. Yeah, I, I yeah, okay. I, I, I agree with your overall discussions when you were when you were going through it before for all the for all the very similar reasons. Uh, I, I don't. <laughs> I'm not sure what I said on the occasion of our. I don't think I. Well, anyway, in my view, it is not a, a significant change to reduce the age to 55. Um, I think this, we've dealt with this thing long enough, over a long enough period of time. Um, I think that Maslin made some important points about what the uh, discrimination laws provide, and I would just as soon clean it up, give them their opportunity to uh, work with the 55 age restriction. Uh, I really don't see that as going to be a parking issue. I, 
go by that building a lot. I, if I see one car coming out of there on occasion, that's it. I don't see a whole lot of traffic. Uh, to the extent the line of sight is an issue, um, that that's the uh, the court has permitted it, and there's nothing we can do with that. So uh, I I will uh, vote uh, in favor of this particular resolution. But. Um, Having said that, if no one is persuaded by my eloquent argument, then, <laughs> then I guess it's time for you folks to uh, write up the, uh, the, the uh, resolution. We'll, we'll work something up for next week. Thank you, George. Okay, thanks. All right, back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. The next item on the agenda is special permit application number 328, the Andrew Shore Memorial Trust and Scout Cabin, uh, 70 Old Kings Highway, North proposal to utilize the subject property for the administrative offices and overflow program used for daring scouting and, and ancillary activities. The use of the main building on the property will primarily be limited to individual and small group meetings with some exceptions. Activities are to include Cub Scout den meetings, STEM venture crew meetings, rank advancement board of review, boards of review, Merit Badge Fairs classes, Adult Scout Leader Training, Fundraising Online Auctions, and the Operation of Small Scouting Store. When not in use to scouts, um, the application the application proposed to rent space for limited, limited community use. The carriage house at the rear of the property will continue to be used as a residence. Um, if you guys remember, the um, the Boy Scouts bought that house that's on, um, it's kind of sort of across from the Darien Ice Rink or, or near where the Darien um, Old Kings Highway Tennis is. They've had it for a while. They want to be able to have the right to have meetings in there, <coughs> rent it out to um, small groups when they're not using it and also have a little store area so people from outside the area can come here and buy their badges and scarves and hats that they lost. Um, the, the, again, this kind of sort of has an accessory dwelling unit in it because there's a cottage in the back that's rented mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. um, we went round and round a little bit with parking. Mr. Flaherty, Craig Flaherty presented the application um, and we kind of sort of figured out that the parking does work. The other issue was overflow parking when they do have big meetings. Um, at one point in time, they wanted to have the overflow parking at the Community Service Church, which is next, is that the right, the right name of it? Uh, for, for congregation, the first, first congregation church. Um, those people, that that group, really didn't sign off on the overflow parking there. They got an agreement with um, family centers, family five ninety post road, which fronts on the post road, and people are going to walk around the block to park there. Um, there was also some parking in the street. Yeah, there's like seven spots in the front. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think the police chief did chime in on something of the local traffic authority that we can't use some of those spaces no i think he was talking about the spaces in the front of the actual unit itself on uh, old king's highway north yep like in the front not the seven yep. spots that are in front of like the entrance to the school area okay there's yep. a tough line of sight there yep. Yep. he doesn't want parking there. right yep. so questions yep. on this application amy thoughts on it did you watch this on tv um i did um refresh my memory do they envision having um their was there any discussion about limiting um, big events during those preschool hours with regards to the parking that with the first congregational church that's right there? Was there any discussion about that? I don't know if we ever talked about hours caps. That's a good question. I, I have to read, I was read a little bit of the application earlier today. I think they're trying to minimize larger events. Yeah. Um, but I think. Uh, I Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry to interrupt. So, I mean, they only they only talked about like the the auctions that they do online now through Auction yep. Ninja. I think yep. um, that pickups would be during the day. I don't think that there were too many day meetings. There was one organization that thought about coming in to do some type of class. I don't know. I don't remember if it was boxing or whatever it was. But music. Yeah. Okay. Music. Perfect. Um, and I think that they talked about that, but not occupying all the spots or anything into the school. Okay. or church area because that, that, that does have when you go through there when there's little kids coming yep. and crossing and y we don't need to make that more dangerous there in any way right. um that's that's my concern george 
Uh, I uh, just have this uh, concern about seeing their uh, parking area become what looked like the old Scott cabin around auction time. So I, I would really love to limit uh, storing any uh, auction items out of doors uh, to 24 hours, something like that. I just would be concerned that it's going to stay there for a while. They're going to take up parking and it's going to Do become... they even do that event anymore? Is it just all now online? All online. Too. Yeah. I think it's all online, so I don't think they actually have that. No, but what, 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 the, what the applicant said is that if I drop off my lawnmower or I drop off my old patio furniture, they stick it in the back parking lot. It yep. takes up two spaces until they okay. put it up on auction.com and somebody buys it yep. and then that person comes in. So it, it technically could sit there. If I dropped it off on a Saturday and, and somebody buy it, doesn't buy it until the next Saturday, it could technically sit there for a week. But it's not like an event no. where, you know, Correct. everybody, it was that one weekend drop off and right. deluge of traffic and. Right. No, not that. Not that's scout. That's yeah. Yeah. Cabin routine, but yeah. Because the, 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 I mean, in the big picture, I think, they bought this building and use it for overflow and all their other programming, and they're not going to do the renovation that was approved at the Scout Cabin. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they, instead of having the big auction, yep. you know, now it's all done online. Yep, 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 yep. Um, As to my comment, I, I acknowledge and I, I said to Jeremy and, and Fred that I'm not sure how you'd enforce my suggestion, but if it, it was at least included in the resolution, I think they would get the point that we want limited storage of items uh, outside because that does i mean i don't know if 24 hours is going to work but we can probably pick a number pick a number yeah but you're right if, if i drop off my lawnmower on friday you know then somebody buys it and you will be the only one dropping things off. <coughs> you could have a whole bunch of stuff there yeah and they still have the cabin so they could use the cabin for some of the stuff do we know why they won't allow like drop-offs at the main scout cabin since that seems like you know for most of the stuff I, they're storing i mean my belief is what they're trying to do is make this more of in the auction drop-off pickup uh versus the scout volunteers saying oh if it was patio furniture you must be at the other building or taking it in at the other building with really no place to put it uh that was my read of the application was trying to make this that drop-off pickup site uh, I guess going to George's argument, they, they, I think if I recall, stop me if I'm wrong here, Jeff, they talked about putting things like patio furniture and lawnmowers kind of next to the garage, outside of the parking lot as much as possible, or possibly in the garage. I think they had referred to that possibility. Uh, a day like last night, for example, they might say, you know what, throw, throw as much stuff in the garage as possible. Is there, yeah, that's fine. It's the outdoor storage I worry about. Yeah, no, because we, we did go over that. They were double counting. They said we have four garage spaces and then like seven outside spaces. I'm like, wait a second. But then they said later that, oh, we use that garage for the lawnmowers and all the stuff inside. Yeah. Okay. So is there any way that we could put in right. the resolution that all auction stuff has to be handled at uh, the Scout Cabin on West Avenue? I don't know if the two, if the two locations are combined or, um, or adjoined. Yeah. Or, or you're thinking the larger? I'm thinking all of it. All of it. I mean, they do, I mean, technically it's done there now. I mean, so do, does it have to be moved over? I think what you'd have to do is just say it's prohibited on this site, and that would leave them yeah. only the scout cabin to do it. And I'm not sure. That, that's not what I suggest. You can't connect it to, because let's say they sell the scout cabin. You know. Yeah. They, they, I think do they put some sort. Of, I mean, I, th I think your point's well taken. We have to. We have to. You don't want, if everyone cleans out their garage on Memorial Day and right. dumps all their stuff right. there, right. Memorial Day Saturday, you kind of toast. Yeah. Seven okay. Two hours. Um, Jeff, questions? Nope. Jim, anything to add? Uh, I'm a proud graduate, if that's the right term, of Henley School, school Den 3 <laughs> of 1955. Wow. Uh, if I should far? recuse myself, I'm not going to. <laughs> no, no, no. Failing no. which, I endorse the uh, application. So I think you're getting, everyone's approving, endorsing the application subject to modifications. We'll, we'll tr try to get something for the commission next week. Okay. It might take us a couple of iterations to read the draft. Yep. 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 Uh, next item. 
proposed amendments to the Darien Zoning Regulation COZR number 4 2022 Amendment to the Special Permit Application 188F, as in Frank, Darien Board of Education, 2 and 80 High School Lane, proposing to amend the Darien Zoning Re Regulations to permit the lighting and public address facilities at the stadium on Darien High School property to be utilized for nonprofit educational and community purposes inclusive of but not limited to um, athletic activities. Proposal to amend the applicant's previous special permit to expand the hours and number of days that lighting and public address facilities may be utilized and to expand the permissible uses of the facility from limited athletics used to include community-wide events and activities including those of groups and organizations unaffiliated with the town of Darien or this special or this school district the hearing closed on July 12 2022 decision deadline uh, September 15 2022 this is the application for the high school lights that was approved I guess over five years ago we limited them to a number of athletic sporting events. I think it's eight or 10 in the fall. And I don't remember how many was in the spring. I don't even know if that was addressed. Um, they wanted then right now they're only approved to be on Friday nights. And if I, if I say something wrong, make sure you correct me. They're only approved on Friday nights. The second major item is um, the, the lights now during the week get shut off at 7.30. They want to extend that to nine o'clock, um, and it's basically Monday through Monday through um, Thursday. Yeah, Monday through Thursday. There is no use of the lights um, on Sundays, and there's no use of I guess the sound system. The other piece of the application is um, only the Darien High School people are allowed to use the um, speaker system the, the um, sound system the small groups that come in also cannot use um, DJF Allen cannot use the sound system they can also not bring in portable um, sound system things I think the only thing where that would be different if, if you did have a Battle of the Bands rock concert there at night mm -hmm. um, they're bringing in their own portable sound system um, in, in that aspect, the chief of police was alerted to this application because we waived the um, traffic study item. Um, did the chief of police ever comment back to you saying that they wanted to comment on it at all? No. No? Okay. Whatever comment was in the record. Okay. Um, so I think it, 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 it boils down to, to me, it, it's, it's, two, it's two major items. One is the number of events that they can have. Uh, well, actually, no, it, it, it's first, first item is they want to have Friday night lights also on Saturday night lights, okay? So it's adding one day a week, and they want to make the, light, the time that the lights go off at night um, to instead of 7.30 to 9 o'clock. Um, Friday and Saturdays, I think, are 10 o'clock, isn't it? Right, cause that would be a game night. Um, I don't think they have, I don't think they use the lights I guess if you had a special event on a Friday night, um, again, just to extremes or example, as a rock concert, then the lights would get turned off at whatever is 10 o'clock. Um, we went back into, there was, there was some discussion there. We went back into um, the number of days that they could have it. The, the, the sporting season in the fall consists of about eight weeks. The sporting, the sporting season in the spring consists of about eight weeks. So they need um, two nights. So it's, it was 32 days for sporting events, if you did that. And technically, you could have a field hockey game at 6 o'clock or 5.30, because it's dark in the fall, you know, in October. And you could have a football game at 7.30, because it's dark in the fall. So you could technically have two sporting events in the same evening. Um, that never really came up in the application discussion, but if, if you took it to the extreme, you could do it. So what, what I would say is that instead of making the cap go from eight per, um, per season for these night games, make it something like 50, 
because they don't need more than, according to the athletic director, they don't need more than 32 for the school. They, did they ask for a number? They just no. wanted the hours. They wanted. They wanted. Right. They were trying to show like how many they thought that they might have based on the amount of teams. Yeah. They yeah. want. They want. They want no limit. Yeah. They asked for no limit. The issue is the hour. Not, yeah. Not how many. What difference does it make? So I, I would put like when they showed us the graphic. The other towns, some towns had limits on it, some had no limits. I would like to keep a limit on it so it's not infinity. I mean, I don't think they can, we want them to use this thing, you know, 52 weeks a year. So that would be 152 weeks a year times two days. That's what, you know, 104? That's okay. the maximum? Well, yeah, well, the summer would not, not likely be yeah. much of an issue, but okay. Great. Um, relative to the, to the lights on, um, during the week, which is Tuesday to Thursday, the, the director of DJFL got up there. Those are the ones that really use the lights. They do not practice at this facility four days a week. They only practice, I think it was three days a week. Um, I think there's no practice on Mondays and there's, there's you know, it's, they're not on every night. Um, when he, I, made it, he made it seem like they were done before, got dark. before it got dark anyway. Right. So it's not like the lights would technically be on, so. So in, in that aspect, when, when I was a kid, between ages of 8 and 12, we, we practiced until 9 o'clock at night. Um, I think they're asking for an hour and a half extra if they're going to use it for some reason. I don't think that's a big issue. Did the lights have no spillover at all? I think the big issue was really related to the sound system. There is no sound system ever used Monday to Thursday, um, so it's never even turned on. DJFL, even for their games, is not allowed to use the sound system exist or a portable for that matter. Um, so that's my, that's my two cents on it. Um, let's start at Jim's end this time. Any questions on this? Did, 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 I, did I summarize the application properly? Where did we come down on Sunday? There's no, Nothing. no lights on Nothing. Sunday? No. no lights, no sound on Sunday. Right. Right. That was, I think, part of the question is, would the lights be on Sunday? There's no proposal for Sundays, is my recollection. Jim, thoughts? This uh, original application for the lights created a hell of a firestorm, if I, as I remember. Oh, it sure did. It, it I, did I not get appealed. <laughs> it didn't get appealed. Well, because yeah, no. it got lights. The, um, my question is, Okay, some of the people that were objected to it, the first go around, have moved. Uh, other neighbors have gotten accustomed to it, so maybe it's not a big deal to everybody. As far as I'm aware, we've really not heard from the neighbors on, on this application. The, the way it's, well, let me, let me back, the way it's drafted and the way it exists today is if a neighbor has a problem, they go to the school. If that doesn't work, they go to the administrative. So it's all handled, and if that doesn't work in administration, they go to the Board of Education. So what we kind of want to do is, is I, don't, I don't think it ever wants to land up on Jeremy's desk or Fred's desk and then eventually add up us that someone's upset about the lights. It's the way it's designed with policy, um, I think it's 1200, it's supposed to be handled with inside the Darien School District administration. Okay, but this application is not a, it's not been a secret. No, no, it's not been a secret. My point is that they haven't the the neighbors have not been at the gates with torches. No, there, there was one last There's week. Three neighbors. Yeah, there was there was one last week, and I think his concerns were pretty much addressed right then and there by right. Mr. Oh. Mahalski spoke. Who lives on Middlesex Road? Guy. Harrison, that's the lives on Harrison or Harrison Hunter. I'm not sure that which, yeah. where yep. it goes, but Linda Linda Lane, I believe. Right. No, no, the guy the or Hummingbird. There was right. a guy that bought somebody's house yep. where the tailgates used to be. He Correct. complained about the the sound happening at 4:30 in the evening. Well, there was complaints I'm about. Sorry, it. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. No, you're good. you're good. About the type of music that was being played, there were some concerns about that, and more so not necessarily the lights, but the loud music was certainly noted by the neighbors. Mr. Mahulski read a, a lengthy uh, speech into the record, which you may recall. Um, so it's, it's, there, was some, there was some issue that there was music that was played that was, um, had lyrics in it were not great, but 
that gets com yeah. that gets those those complaints go to the school and okay. the administrator get handled administrative inside the school. Okay. So whoever did that, they got their hands slapped. But that's the way it's designed to do it. Okay. So you okay? I'm okay with it. Jeff? Definitely okay. George? I think we need to monitor the uh, decibel level. Apparently part of the um, application is to implement the Connecticut statute, whatever it is, uh, as to the decibel level. And to that end, I think we should require um, audiometering <laughs> of, of um, uh, maybe half of the home football games in the fall, something like that or other uh, uh, evening uh, activities um, that go beyond seven o'clock. I think we ought to know. Mr. Hunter was clear that he didn't believe that, uh, well, he, he came up with an over 70 decibel level and, uh, and there were enough others who kept saying, the light's not the issue, it's the noise that's the issue. I think we ought to quantify what that issue is and. Uh, how that complicates the permit itself, I'm not sure. I, I guess I'm saying I'd like them to come back at the end of the season and show us the results of those audiometers. I, I guess that's an interesting question, George. Uh, we, one issue was the amplification. I'm looking at the speaker on the wall. Yeah. Is music that comes out of speakers like that versus someone who brings uh, what's called a boombox or portable stereo or what, whatever it is, uh, does the commission wish to say differentiate between the two types? Yeah, I, I was, mm, uh, you know, <laughs> I was, was thinking kind of halfway between the football field and the neighbors. Uh, I would assume they have several different spots for their metering devices, uh, so maybe three of them, and uh, kind of at either end of the football field, and then one in the 50-yard line, kind of set out. I don't know, 50 feet from the uh, field. No, you saying do um, testing for the lack of a better word periodically or for for several games? Okay. So, and that is that day games or night games? No, night games. Okay. Yeah, after seven o'clock, if okay. a football game or other activity, a band, any other concert. Uh, I don't think we need to get into <laughs> demonstrations or anything. Just those sorts of things. And, and or, you're, or maybe they should do every game. And uh, you're saying testing expensive. music or the PA system? Uh, noise. I think they should be. I think she should be monitoring noise under the lights after seven o'clock. Uh, uh, for, game, for game nights, not Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah, okay. I guess so. I, I'm not worried about the yeah. DJFL. I, and what I struggled with is uh, some of the some of the come you know, commentary that people made, I think is real with regards to the sound, but, but I don't know that that's the, the extension of the lights is, is going to change or affect some of the complaints. And, and one of the, the people said, think about the hours of operation and the sound. And um, I do think to the extent that, you know, we, you know, the one testimony was in the afternoon. It was, an, and I don't know if that was a, you know, a lacrosse game right after school, and that was at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. Right, that's what he said. This application is not going to change that. Um, so it's not going to address some of the neighbors' complaints. That's that's part and parcel with the school activity. Um, so I I try to think about incremental. Um, monitoring or incremental effects to the neighbors with regards to adding a, a, a Saturday night and extending um, activity beyond 7.30 to 9. And I don't think it's a bad idea to have periodic um, check-ins as to what, what that noise level is. And I don't know what that looks like, but I do think it's, it's, it's not just going to be for school operations because you know lacrosse right. games are still going to happen at three o'clock yeah. um no, we're not worried about yeah that. but it's it i don't i don't mind i think you have a potential idea there as far as a saturday night and a friday night you know what what is that event going to, you know doing mm -hmm. um I do just think there might be. I, I like. I like the in concept the idea that this is a asset for the, in the Darien school system 
I read, I don't, we both read the, um, the priority use that they go through. I was mm -hmm. very comfortable with the mm -hmm. priority use that the dairy in, their policy. Um, I th think it made a lot of sense. And, I, and in theory, I think they should be able to control that asset and, and under those policies. So I like the idea of turning it over to them, but I am also mindful of making sure we are not adding to um, what the neighbors are already experiencing. The, the, uh, agreed. The, the one thing that, that I don't know if we can fix it, and I don't know if it's, it's not part of this application, but the one gentleman, I think it was the Mr. Harrison Hunter guy, um, he said he was on a work call, and he was on a work call, you know, and the sound was loud, and he had to apologize to whoever was on his work call with. Technically, I mean, I'm guessing that had to be at 4.30 in the afternoon. You know, you're not going to be on a work call at 7.30 at night, you know, on a Friday or Saturday. So, I mean, you might be because you get <laughs> ships in the Suez Canal, but... Um, there's, there's nothing we can do about that. That's not a right. part of this application. Right. Or, or is his kid's trying to sleep. I mean, that... It, it, his right. kid's I taking wanna, a nap. I don't want to go... I mean, I'll just go a different way with that, but... His kid's taking a nap at 3 o'clock. That's got... It's not got to do with this application. Right. So the yeah. testing should begin at 7 p.m. on a Friday or Saturday night and should be done half a dozen times during the first six months. Do we, do you, offhand, do we know what the state regulation is relative to sound? Because that's their big argument, is that football yeah, games they, are they're I think exempt. they quoted 65 or some such decimal, but I, I didn't read the statute. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. The state statute exempt sports. Oh, does it? Yeah, that's, that's, the whole sh that's the whole issue. And yet it's specifically included in the special permit, I think. I read it somewhere here. They included it or we included it. Because it's, it's you can't, can't if control the band, how if loud the, a crowd's going to get. You can't control how many yeah. people are going to be at a game. You, no, you can't yeah. control the band. You can control how noisy it is at 8 o'clock by not having lights. Yeah, but during the day, I mean, they, well, I mean, look at Harrison, Hunter, Hunter Harrison's comments about during the day. I mean, you've got yeah. to similar situation but yeah I don't think we can do anything about that right but I think we can in the evening okay yeah so uh, it, it sounds like we're drafting it up as an approval with some kind of modifications and and, and the what the one gentleman that got up there and testified he wanted like a permanent you know decimal level counter thing which is cost something I mean I think that's going oh, yeah, a little I bit beyond okay he wanted some kind of permanent thing. I, I bet you, Nickel, you can check decibels with your iPhone today. I don't know. You do. <laughs> they come out with a microphone. They do it. They're done for the firehouse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they did to you guys at the firehouse, right? Okay. Um, so are we drafting this up as an approval, and then we'll make modifications and noodle can with you, it? Can you give me clarity on uh, the sporting events? Is it sporting events like a game, a competition sporting event, or is it practice and you know can you get clarification on yeah yeah because I mean if that's exempt I, I understand that wanting to do the monitoring but if that's exempt it, I, you know I don't know that we can control the game part or then are we just making sure we're not adding to the the nuisance during the week which is the practice part I you know I, I, I don't don't know where I think on that you follow uh, yeah I don't think we can do much about the practice part it goes to nine o'clock and that's okay but it's going to ten o'clock Fridays and Saturday nights with that kind of noise I think we need to have some accountability for that and uh, I'm looking at Fred but I don't mean to yeah, no, I, know. Well, I, I guess that's a question is uh, certainly the PA system is used for games whether it's lacrosse field hockey football it doesn't matter is the commission saying you can't use the PA system for practices? I think they agreed. I think that, that they, yeah, they, no, had, they had originally they, said that last week that they weren't going to use it, that it was only to be used during during games. Is what I, right. I would, yeah, yeah. Um, I would I would check that. I mean, I know okay. they, there's a P, during during practice on the oval, there's a PA system that they use because they do play music at practice for the, on the cross practice on the oval. They did. 
I've, I've, I've seen it. With D, we went and DY Lax, we were not allowed to bring portable things okay. here. Um, I mean, your your point. I think your your point's well taken. What about my idea of limiting it to 50 um, events? I'm okay. putting a cap in there. That's fine. Anyone care about that? Because I don't want to make it infinity. It's I want to put something in there. Limit it to 50 events. I don't think there's any winter sports teams using the field in the winter, so I think we're good there. It's just spring, and then summer they're not using it anyway. So, and in the spring, I mean, it's it's, I mean, it's light out. I mean. But, so 50 per school year, or okay. 50 per calendar year? I think it's 50 per calendar year. Because the, the proposal is that it, they could use outside of people. So it's not just our sports teams. Right. It's, right. you know, hosting whatever who's asking to use the facility. So Some, but those have to be approved by the Board, board of Education. Right. Right. And they, like, like the, they're in, you know, F, let's, say, let's say FC, whatever, the NYFC wants to play a soccer game here, you know, at 9 o'clock on a Friday in, on July, in, in July, that would, be approved, that would be allowable by our regs if they get through Board of Education. Right. I'm, I'm just thinking if you do it by calendar year, what's likely to happen is they're going to take their package of 50 and start using them in January, February, March, April. You're going to get to the end of the football season. And they're going to want to save a few, presumably, for games. potential oh. home football games. Um, so, but if you're using That's calendar good. year and this gets approved by September, October, they'll have the balance of the year. I right, guess, with Mr. Manfredonia, the athletic director, could manage it, figure out how to manage. <clears throat> he's yeah. got to save twenty for the football season. If he uses them all up in the spring and the summer, he's, he's ran out of days in, in the okay. fall. And are you talking about lights usage six days a week or just the two days a week? It's just the two days. Okay. It's the two days. Yeah, whatever. I, I'm fine with all of them. Because that's what I had him get up there. I said, what's the number of dates? And he said eight. And I said times two is 16. Then the spring was eight times two is 16. So you need a total of 32. You know, then you can use the other 18, you know, during the summer months. Or if yeah. months are dead of winter, you know. I, I don't know if anyone's going to go out there in February. <laughs> Turn the lights. Right. What? Um, okay. Just so I'm clear, I'm talking about not just the PA system, but I'm talking about crowd noise and whatever else kind of noise is made. Um, I think we need to know what that level is after 7 o'clock uh, on any of the Fridays and Saturdays. That's, that's, um, that's, it's point well taken, but let's just double check the, the state regulation. Yeah. Okay. Because I know sporting events. <clears throat> Sporting well, events are exempt. It. Yeah. As I said, it's somewhere it appeared here. I know it did. So yeah. we have to go back. I think the uh, I think the application included reference to uh, the old special statute. permit. And obviously they can do that. Yeah. Oh, it the was old special permit. Maybe maybe that was a. In any event, apparently you can agree to use the state statute even if the state statute would otherwise exempt you. They, they, in their, they, on their proposal on the bottom was footnoted it was in accordance with the state statute. Yeah. And I don't remember what those yeah, numbers are. Right. Okay. So, and we're not asking the state to enforce it. We're just using the standard set by the state. Because I remember way back when, the, the big deal was with was, was, um, Betsy Haggerty Ross. I think her kid was in the band. <laughs> well, that's not over personalized. Thing, <laughs> and, and she wanted okay. the band to be able to play at the end of the game. Uh, and all that happened. But I, anyway. I, so I want to make sure that reflects the majority of the commission. Steve, you had said uh, allow the lights to be on later Saturdays and Sundays only? No, Fridays and Saturdays. Fridays, Saturdays. Fridays, Fridays no and Saturdays. Two days. So that would be 52 times 2, 104 days, and then a further limit of 50 events. So you're saying Fridays and Saturdays only, and of those, Mr. Manfredonia can sort them out to whittle those 104 down to 50. Yes. Yes. Is that the majority of the commission? He can use 50 of them over, yeah. For the Friday and Saturdays. Correct. Yeah. Not for the weekday. Because he's not going to need them yeah. in the summertime or whatever. Right. So anyway, yeah, that's fun. <clears throat> the only time you would have a football game or a lacrosse game during the week on a Thursday is if they make the playoffs. You could have a Thursday game at home, which would go to 10 o'clock. No, nope. nope. it's at nine. No, it ends at nine. 
Thursday, Monday through Thursdays proposal. at nine o'clock. Their proposals. Okay. Uh, Thursday, Monday through Thursdays nine. Yeah. Yeah. So they can't have a Thursday night football game. I mean, during they, playoff time. Not after nine. Not okay. After nine. If that's what it says, that's what it said. It, I'm not trying to expand it. Okay. So the only other thing I want to try to bring up, which we spoke about earlier, is if we could, in fairness to the school and Board of Education, vote on this next week versus waiting until the 15th of September, since they're already planning out, you know, games for the season for football. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it makes the most sense. Okay. So. I mean, I think we're all in agreement with, with the exception of the couple questions that have been asked. But I think that, you know, just in fairness to them, we should try to vote next week. Know, you got two days to write this up. Yeah, so Fridays and Saturdays only, limit of 50 events per year, no PA system for practices, games only. The zone change would go through, which would allow outside groups to use it, is the sense I'm getting from the commission, uh, with those parameters, and then George's uh, requirement for testing. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, that's it. Um, next item is it's, ooh, it's not 10 o'clock. Next item is delivery regarding any pu public items closed on tonight. Anything you want to talk about tonight? Was there any of those? The only I, hearing that was closed was the uh, Craig Flaherty presented the new house for the Tweedy subdivision, the house that's in the flood zone with the shared drainage system. That zone was closed. Yeah, we're not going to be able to write it up for next week, anyways, but uh, we'll take whatever feedback you may have. All good, bye, man. Any questions on that one? Yep. Any questions on that one, Jim? Tweet your house? No. Nope. Staff is instructed to wrap a positive resolution on that one. Yep. Okay. The next item on the agenda is um, someone wants to extend their um, their house request for a time to complete the project. We got a short letter in the packet about that. Um, the guy just wants it. We usually grant it for what? How much is he on? Letter to request extension of the time. Person? He just said request. Just yeah. time. How right. much do we usually get? I mean, we usually give them uh, six months to a year. In this case, uh, it got approved July 13, 2021. They are now about 75% of the way through the project. I was out there visiting the site, uh, doing some regrading for a new driveway. Six uh, months? I would say six months, which would bring them to basically January. Yeah. Six months, okay. good? Yeah. Six months, yep. great. Okay, great. Uh, we'll Five approve. zero, six months. Yeah. Five zero. Six zero. Yep. Five. 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 Um, next thing is approval of minutes. Do we have time for the minutes or you want to sc scoot out of here? Ten of two. I'm going to get them out of the way. Red wants them out of the way. We're out of the way. Okay, we have February 15 minutes, which is the day after my daughter's birthday or <laughs> oh Memorial Day. I love talking about my kid's birthday. Um, what do we have? Questions, comments, Scribner's errors, typos in this one. We have a resolution from February. Uh, we can't touch that on the first one. Is this February 15th? February 15th we're looking at. I was trying to figure that one out too. I asked Fred that. <laughs> Respond back. So we're really good for work 50. These were also emailed to everybody too. Anyway, um, on this one, it was the guidepost was February 15th um, to um, 682 Post and Post Road. There was a guy that put um, some facial thing, but a house and was put facing the ground floor. Um, next item was Cheryl's Road application. Uh, next thing was Pasture Lane, so was building a house. Uh, West Avenue is Sydney West Avenue, 222 along my Point Road. And then we got into um, one parkland. So we the decision on the following items. That was the resolution on parklands. No, it was the minutes on parklands. Then we had a resolution on parklands we can't change. Any questions, comments, typos on this one? No. I'm out of Okay. Kim, you good with that? I'm good. Motion to approve the minutes from February 15th as submitted. One, two, three, four. Amy four. Will, nothing. Amy's, Amy's out. Amy wasn't here. Amy is out. Okay. Uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff proposed it. George seconded. Right. Sure. <laughs> it's an official meeting. Uh, next item is Thursday, June 30th. This was a special meeting because I moved the date. Um, 
to, to I think, accommodate me. First time we're here with <laughs> Seven yeah, Cedric Avenue. Uh, uh, Seven Cedric, um, which is the thing that got withdrawn. The next item was proposed amendments to Terry and, um, to the federal commons item. We just went over that again tonight. Country Club of Darien, that was their application. The Kling House, we did that. And then we did the general meeting with regards to um, the Roten Heights Common Shopping Center. Application for hot chicken, we, we did deliberate on that. Then we did an adopt a resolution for um, Darren Hot Chicken. That takes up the majority of this one. We can't change any of those items anyway. Um, then we have another resolution from um, Edge Hill Road. Uh, which one was that? Uh, yeah, three eight, eight, Edge Hill Drive. You can't change that. And that was a dock, right? Mm -hmm. And then another one, which is from um, 297 West Avenue. And then the guy was fixing his yard. Mm -hmm. then another one from um, 37 Stephanie Lane. That's the guy that I think subdivided his house and gave it away. Or his land gave it away, and then the proposed uh, questions, yeah, comments, typos, scrimmers there on that one. All good. All good. Look for a motion to approve. Jim Rand makes a motion. Looking for a second. Sure. George Rago makes a second. All those in favor? Four nothing. Abstain. Yep. Abstain. Yep. Uh, one abstention. Got it. Okay. Next on the agenda is any other items? Is two thirds commission. We're not going to have any two thirds any more items. Our next coming meeting is July 26th, uh, 2022. That is the meeting where we're going to talk about something really important. Housing. Affordable housing plan. Affordable housing plan. Right. Yeah. The commission is having a public hearing. Dave Keating will be back next week to present the plan and a vote, possible housing. vote on adopting it. We have about five or six other what we expect to be relatively minor public hearing items. And then we'll try to get three or four draft resolutions done. It's a very full night. And that's live and in person in room 206. Yes. Okay. And uh, maybe we should just make public where a copy of that plan can be found. Yes, the, the affordable housing plan can be found on the town website, www.darienct.gov backslash AH plan. It's also copies available in our office for people to review. Uh, we are working with the town's communication director on getting word out via Facebook, Instagram. Uh, so certainly uh, word is out. And we also published legal notice two times in the paper on that. It's a good, it's a good meeting about the affordable housing plan, which has, we, we again, we, get, we opted to have a public hearing on it, which many towns did not. Um, and then if it gets approved, well, actually say public hearing, so we'll listen to everybody. Yeah, public I mean, hearing and then posted potential to the website. It was sent out on June 17th. Yeah, the draft is dated June 16th, so it's, uh, as I said, okay. been around for a while, and uh, look forward. Anyone wants to email comments before the meeting, uh, the email address to send comments, darianpzc at darianct.gov, and we'll have those, whatever comes in, ready in your packets this so Thursday. It's like 45 days by the time the public hearing goes. Yeah, certainly. June 17th to July 26th. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, with that said, anticipation motion to adjourn. Ooh. Amy makes a motion. Oh, Jeff's hand went up first. Got a second. Yeah. Jim yeah. makes a second. Yeah. All in favor? Yeah. Five zero. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, yeah. TV 79. Thank you, Bobby. We lost Bonnie. Yeah.